Hey guys, brand new podcast, and I am on tour. Go to burtburtburt.com to get your tickets to see me on the tour. And that's it. Burtburtburt.com. Uh, tour dates are scrolling right there, or whatever the remainder of these are. Uh, today, dream guest, in my opinion. Here's the thing I love when I find a fucking show on the internet and I geek out and I become obsessed with them. And then I find out they know who I am and we can do a podcast together. It has happened with Riley Whitelam. Um, it's happened with Casey Neistat, Van Neistat, and I think those are sometimes my best interviews because I know I know a lot about their body of work, and not that I don't with everyone, but sometimes with comics, we're just here to bullshit, and the conversation's got to find itself, and then sometimes when I get these guys that I'm fans of, I can really kind of dig in and, and ask them more poignant questions for their fans, so hopefully if you're a fan of Sunny Side, then you're here and you're watching this, and you're going to enjoy this interview because I'm asking a lot of the questions that you probably wondered. Because I know they were the ones I wondered when I watched the videos. Uh, he's got the uh, a show called Best Ever Food Review Show. Um, and I found him while I was in Macon, Georgia. And I started binge watching every episode. And uh, and then we did an episode in, on him on Open Tabs. Sharing the show. Ooh, what was that smell? Did you smell that? I just got a weird smell. Uh, we <laughs> I thought I was having a stroke. Um, we shared it on open tabs. We talked about the show, but we talk about this on the podcast. The one thing that is, that makes us very, um, similar. And that is, uh, we both are ultimately, I mean, I, I guess ultimately failed travel channel hosts, <laughs> you know, my failure to, was a little longer and prolonged, <laughs> But we talk about that, and we talk about having success on the other side of that, and we talk about our similarities in that, and we talk about how he got into, how he, why he left uh, uh, Minnesota, wh why he chose Korea, why he ended up, how he ended up in Vietnam, how he started his show. We talk about his two travel channel show pilots or Food Network. You'll hear about that there, and then we talk about we talk extensively about Vietnam and Vietnam food. I think, mm -hmm. and how on our love for Vietnam. We talk about Vietnam and the pandemic. And, uh, and it's a great interview. It is a great interview. If you are a fan of Best Ever Food Review Show, then you're going to love this interview. And if you are a fan of Burt Cast and you've never heard of Sonny, then I suggest you going over to Best Ever Food Review Show and checking out a couple episodes because it's a good goddamn show. And I am a subscriber and I'm obsessed with it. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, American, off the shores of Minneapolis, St. Paul, Moved to Korea at the ripe age of 24. Maybe that's how I'm going to start doing my ads. I'll do like a real fucking promo. Into Vietnam, where he started his career as an internet superstar. Host of the best ever food review show, Sunnyside. Oh, my God. Oh, this is fucking here. Can I is this is this the one is this like you the one you wear? Uh no, it's a little different. But that one has my face on it. Yeah, this one has your face on it. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, branding is fucking brilliant. It really is brilliant. Cause I, I started watching your videos. I saw you with the headband on and I was like, what's this? And then I was like, huh? And then after a couple of videos, I'm sitting there going, I like it. The headband, it's like it's almost like it's it's it sounds silly, but it's like I perform without a shirt on. Right. And it was not a cognizant choice. It was something I was doing on the road, didn't think would ever become a branding thing and then all of a sudden people know me as the shirtless guy it just fucking works yeah i fought against it in the beginning really yeah because uh, i just thought it was oh are we is a podcast yeah, 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 literally yeah, yeah. happening yeah. right now oh, it's happening. you don't waste any time no i like that no guys i we used to do back in the day we used to do rogan like fucking nine years ago or whatever and uh we would have the funniest conversations off before the show yeah, started yeah, yeah, yeah. And during his ad reads, we'd sit through his ad reads and we'd tell the funny, he'd go, save it for the podcast. And we'd right. never tell them. Keep the tension. Yeah. yeah. So early on, I thought it was kind of douchey. I'm like, I wear, so I've always worn a headband, worn a headband in, in places that were hot. So yeah. I, I, I lived in Korea. If I worked out, I'd wear a headband. I mean, what do you wear for the sweat when you work out? Oh, I, I wear, I, no, I don't wear anything for sweat. I like when sweat pours into my eyes. Oh, but yeah. if, if I'm running, I run the, I ran the LA marathon. I, ran, I wore a hat. Because you at a certain point you're like I need to stop it. Wait, and I don't. I was, wear, and I'm. A, and by the way, I'm a headband guy. If I'm running on the treadmill, sometimes I'll wear a headband. But I don't want to wear like a basketball headband because yeah. that looks even more nerdy. So I would just tie a bandana around my head whenever it was hot, and I would do it for the show so the sweat wasn't in my eyes. And then it just be, kind of became a look. But whenever it wasn't hot at first, I would take it off to try to uh, 
and be like, no, I don't, I don't need it. This isn't yeah. my thing. And then eventually people are like, no, it's your thing. No, it, but, and, and it, but it works. And the thing is when you're traveling, when you're traveling and I feel like your life is just traveling, I feel like your life actually, and I, I want to talk a little bit about what got you to Asia, but you just travel. That's what you fucking do now. Right. And so when you're traveling, a bandana really is handy. Mm. It really is fucking handy. Yeah, absolutely. You could put it over your eyes on the plane. Oh, you could filter water through it. I've never done that. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. <laughs> so wait. So where did you grow up? I grew up in Minnesota. That's right. Okay. And and you were overweight before you started doing the show, right? I uh, my so I've struggled with weight my whole life. It's like a constant issue. I'm the fattest I've ever been. Right, right now? now. Right now. Yeah. Right you now. You look great. Uh, 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 uh. What, what sounds better to say you look thinner in person or bigger in person <laughs> you look thinner in person i look thinner in person i do i think i do i uh, people always say you're so tall and i go yeah I didn't, yeah yeah um so i grew up in minnesota uh yes yeah, so i've been up and down my whole life since i was a kid and now i've got it kind of under wraps but i weigh i have to weigh myself every single day i exercise a lot you're the reason i got back on the scale really yeah you well yeah i, I l listen i I don't do anything in, in moderation, and I, that is definitely comes with YouTube, right. or like or like fi becoming a fan of something. I don't do it in moderation, and so I binge watch you. I mean, I think I watched every. I feel like I watched every episode. Yeah, and uh, and um, that's awesome. And I and I and you said the number one thing you do is you travel with the scale and you get on the scale every day for accountability. <laughs> and I was like. Man, I do big chunks, like a month at a time where I don't get on a scale. And I just, I judge my weight by how my belt fits. Yeah. Which is not, what happens is they start stretching. Right. And then the next thing you know, you're like, hey, man, I'm still fucking really skinny. Yeah. I do that. And then if I can see my uh, my dick when I'm on the toilet, then, I, then I'm like, okay, I'm in pretty good shape. Yeah, but even that can change. Like, um, I could easily put on four or five pounds in a day. I mean, if I went oh, from oh, being yeah. like healthy to binge drinking and, and eating a bunch of food, easily gain five pounds and then you look down and it's like i gotta make, i have to make changes today <laughs> so wait, you, you went to college in minnesota uh so my my history it's tough because uh, i come from a family where my older siblings all were really impressive and academic and they certainly didn't get from my parents my parents were kind of um I, I told myself i wouldn't say white trash on a podcast but they're not gonna listen to this anyways they're a little bit white trashy really fairly dysfunctional home but somehow, like the only way out of that, the only way to rebel in my home was to become academically successful and to go to university, except I was the only one who didn't do that. So I have a brother who who got a PhD, a brother who got a law degree. And then for the longest time, I couldn't figure out my shit. So I uh, failed out of university three different times. Yeah. I just didn't. I was like, what am I here for? What am I doing? Yeah. And I didn't have any purpose in reading books and taking general education classes wasn't my thing. So eventually I'd gotten into radio a little bit. In in Saint uh, Saint Cloud, Minnesota, one hundred four point yeah. seven KCLD. Today's hit music. Yeah, you know, yeah, I, 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 you have a little bit of that voice. Well, yeah, from eleven p.m. to five a.m. That was my shift. Oh, for real? That's for really good people. That's drive time. <laughs> <laughs> That's drive time for alcoholics, <laughs> uh, for people coming home from the bar. So. Uh, I did that for a bit. I applied for a big radio job. I didn't get it, and I was like, "What am I doing?" Like podcasts are coming in. Uh, like, this is around two thousand eight. Yeah. I'm like, radio is not the future. I want to travel before I can. How old were you at the time? Before I develop a career. I'm 24. And so I. At the time. Yeah, at okay, the time. Yeah. So it's 24. I failed out of college multiple times. I'm working at, I got fired from an Applebee's. I work at a, a moving company. Uh, I worked at another serving job. I've, I've had just so many kind of dead end jobs that weren't taking me where I wanted to be. And I was like, okay, before I figure out what my career is, I'm going to go travel and uh, at least live in a different country. Now, this is 2008. I'm, I'm trying to remember when I started the Travel Channel, but this is the boom of Bourdain on travel, right? Oh, yeah. And, oh, so, and I know you're a fan of Bourdain. And that was, um, it's interesting because one of the jobs I had, so I didn't have cable at home, but one of the jobs I had, I would go take care of um, people who, who needed extra uh, assisted living kind yeah. of stuff. And I would stay there overnight and sleep on the couch in case they had any issues. And I would always watch um, Andrew Zimmern's show and Bourdain's show. Well, back Andrew Zimmern's royalty where you're from. Yeah, right. Exactly. He is royalty. And actually, I was back then, I was much more into Andrew Zimmern's show. And I remember him going to Taiwan like really vividly. The, these episodes he did where he had stinky tofu and this crazy looking food. And it was, I was just like, I can't believe that these types of places exist yeah. elsewhere outside of central Minnesota. I know I knew there was a lot out there that I wasn't experiencing, but th that really helped inspire me to go do something outside of 
my comfort zone outside of the place I was used to. Yeah, Andrew Zimmern's show is a tad bit more accessible <clears throat> for the viewer. Bourdain's show is like, you know, it was it was brilliant, it was awesome, but you were part of you was like, I, yeah, I also have to be able to wear cool jeans like that, and I need some. I, I don't even like just his shoes looked expensive. <laughs> right. Everything about him, and then and then I I mean I know from working at the network that there was a part of him that was very very like almost unhappy of like like he just would do things like almost to piss the network off and i was mm. like oh, that's not my brain i always want to make everyone happy i would say andrew simran's take was more like this is objectively what it's like in this country and bourdain's was like this is my interpretation of my experience in this country based on the clash and the smiths right and like what music i grew up to this yeah. is what i thought it would that's an interesting take that's a very very insightful take i wonder what Andrew, I wonder because because I, I know Andrew fairly well. I never met Bourdain, mm -hmm. um, but uh, but yeah, Andrew's Andrew was more almost like um, like a journalist. Mm -hmm. Like this is what this is what you and and very generous. Like mm -hmm. when he when he traveled, they would offer him things. I remember I, I think this is correct. They offered him a can of coffee that they had buried in a Folgers thing, and a it was like it's just like instant coffee, and mm -hmm. they were like, "This is for you." And the way he did it was like, oh, thank you so much. Yeah. It's such an honor. Wow. I remember drinking goat's blood and Tanzania being like, does anyone have AIDS? And they were like, you can't say that. And I was like, well, I'm I'm just curious. Like The who, goat is, in particular. Yeah, whose goat is this? Who fucked? Does anyone fuck this goat? And they're like, stop talking like this. I remember I showed the Hulu tribe porn for the first time. Oh, my God. I never would have thought of doing something like I that. Didn't, I did it on accident. I was in there. <laughs> we were in this doing rolling these bones and, and uh, doing like our fortunes. And I said, this room smells like my man cave. And they're like, huh? I go, oh, oh. I have a man cave. So I tried oh. to pull up a picture of my man cave. And there was a fucking shot of Bonnie Rotten having sex with this black dude. And I was like, and they're like, whoa, whoa, what's that? And I was like, oh, that's America, boys. <laughs> <laughs> They'd never seen a girl with tattoos, let alone like, you know, like, and so, yeah, I was not, the, I was not a good representative of travel at all, but, wow. but you're, but, but also that didn't even make the bloopers uh, <laughs> the behind the scenes. You have no it idea. It seems like it should have. Yeah, yeah. It seems like there's a, like an extended cut DVD out there that, uh, that I would, could be I, for sale. By the way, I would pay, I'll, I'll just putting this out there. I would pay to buy all my footage from all my travel shows and then make the greatest travel shows in the right. world. That's the problem because they cut the balls off it. That's why I love what you're doing because what you're doing circumnavigated all the notes. Yeah. And the notes is what killed the show. And, yeah. and I remember times going, uh, you know, it would, they would, they would switch. They'd be like, so we just don't want you to kind of be a fly on the wall. And they're like, no, but this is how the audience experiences it. You're the conduit of their adventure. And I'm like, fucking pick a lane. I'll do both. Right. But, but so that but, happened to me and we should talk about that but we, i want to talk about travel channel because i i want to hear about your but maybe we should go in order we should go yeah, in order i have so much to talk about with the travel channel and so on there uh, by the way uh all great people all great people I know, I'm, I'm curious to know who you worked with yeah except the lawyers but yeah except otherwise, the lawyers <laughs> otherwise fantastic they're all gone i think the uh so wait uh so they but here's the other difference is like i traveled but i, I do have a fear of flying so travel is not as exciting to me mm. as it is to someone who genuinely says, I want to see the world. Mm. Like someone who goes, I'm excited to get into an airport at 6 a.m. and get and like get on a plane and just go fucking find it and get lost in a city. I hate flying. Do you really? I get in crazy anxiety every time I fly. And oh. it's worse in the US now because it's like the mask and everyone's tense and they're telling you what to do. And but you can suddenly take your mask off for 30 minutes while you eat. It's 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 really weird here. It just doesn't make any sense. But uh, turbulence. I asked a pilot once, has, has a plane ever gone down from turbulence? He's like, no, never. Like, never. So that put me at ease a bit. Yeah. Although he was kind of an alcoholic. I don't know if that was true. <laughs> but um, he said it's never happened. Good. I'll take it. I got to fly tonight. But I hate flying. I fucking hate it. It drives me nuts. So so you're 24 in St. Cloud, and you're like, I want to travel. Right. So I moved to Korea, and it was North like, or South? Uh, south okay <laughs> yeah i've been to the border the dmz border yeah. i've looked into the north but um actually and i have i have a travel friend who's been into north korea because would you, they go, would you go yeah i would but they don't allow americans to go anymore at all after the warm beer guy so the there was a guy there i mean From so so let me back up they used to allow people to take very like prescribed regimented tours yeah and um they would give you rules like you can take a picture but you can't like cut off the head of uh 
of Kim Jong Un or whatever the statue is when you take the picture. They give you all these rules, and um, there was this guy Warm Beer. I forgot his first name, but he he, uh, he was tried from Columbus, to steal. Ohio. He stole a poster. They they convicted him of of whatever the worst crime. Like they put him in a labor camp, and then eventually they did bring him back here, but he passed away. So was, I, I believe in Americans. Or something. I don't think Americans can go there anymore. But uh, yes, I went to South Korea. Very different okay. place. Yeah, South Korea. A lot more black dudes than I thought. Oh, is that right? Well, yeah. so in, in the airport, uh, in the airport, there's a big uh, U.S. military presence there. So that's maybe one of the reasons. Well, I saw five, and I was like, "What the fuck?" Okay, I was like, "This is crazy." And then my buddy Donnell Rollins did time over in South Korea for the military. Oh yeah, I heard him in a podcast. Kind of, I mean, he was great. His Korean was great. Yeah, his Korean. But I was like, <laughs> "All right, it's passable." Yeah. Um. Yeah. So I moved. His English is passable, by the way. <laughs> his English much better than his Korean. <laughs> it's good. You never know. <laughs> I, I had, so I had $2,000 in the bank. This is a story I've never told before. And I've always, I was waiting for Rogan, but I'll tell it here. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just being a dick. <laughs> um, so I, I just had $2,000 in my bank account and I, I didn't have anything to come back to. I mean, my, my parents is uh, again, they, they they were doing great. It's not like I could come back to a nice suburban home. Like I, I sold all my stuff, my car, my lease was gone. I moved to Korea. And I'm like, I need to make something work there. I didn't have a job lined up because I don't have a degree. This is a part I've never talked about. And I don't know if I'm going to be like banned from ever going to Korea again. But you're supposed to, to get a teaching job in Korea, you need a four-year degree. Now, that four-year degree can be in interior design. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't have to be in English. Really? You just need a four-year four -year degree. So I went there at first. I had a connection who gave me a place where I could live, just a tiny crappy apartment on top of an apartment they call it an octop apartment it's like we had a building and then we built a smaller building on the building so we could rent that out too oh. to 200 bucks a month um, how big are we talking bigger than this room size of size of this room okay yeah and so i i moved there and i would do uh english tutoring at first so i i had a contact there who was like okay i'll help you advertise and so this is still when the internet kind of sucked and um the iPhone was coming out maybe a year later or something like that. And so I had to like put up flyers to try to get people where I could teach them English. And I was freaked out. Cause I'm like, I'm decent at English, like, you know, in high school, but I don't have a degree in English. Yeah. But then you go tutor someone and they're like, uh, today I go to work and you're like, Oh, it's no today. I went to work. Yeah. Like I like job. No. Oh no. I like my job. No, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I could do this. Yeah, that's fucking, I get it. And they want to do like conversational English with foreigners. Cause it's highly valued there in Korea. So really for the first uh, few months I was doing that, but my money was running out. And so you would make 40 bucks an hour, but you have to do, if you do three lessons in a day, you're taking the train. You're, like it takes you eight hours to do three hours of teaching. Yeah. And so and wait, how was, were you speak? Were you good in Korean? No. I mean, eventually I got, don't test me now, but uh, eventually I got like pretty passable. Like I could, you know, take taxis and order food and ask a girl for her phone number. Sorry, my wife's right over there. <laughs> but that's, but you, but you're Korean. You went to Korea, not fluent in Korean. No. And just thinking, I'll, I'm going to figure it out. Good God. I'm just going to figure it out. It's a fucking leap of faith. I, the first three days, I don't think I even left my apartment. I was so freaked out. Um, oh, I, went, I, I can imagine that. I went to a grocery store and, and tried paying like $100 for milk. Uh, and they were like, here's all your money back. I just need this one. Because yeah. they're very honest there. So <laughs> yeah. it was a good place to start out. Um, and so I was tutoring, but I was losing money. And I knew I needed a full-time teaching job. And I, I would keep... So you need a visa. Mind you, I was on a tourist visa. A tourist visa lasts 90 days. And so that means... Every 90 days, I need to leave the country and come back. And so for eight years, every 90 days, oh I left the God. country of Korea and I came back. That would and drive me fucking nuts. It was, I lived in constant fear of like, am I going to get deported this time? And now I know um, Joe Rogan, you recently had the North Korean woman, Yunmi maybe, at yeah. Park. I forgot her name. So my story is not quite as intense as hers. <laughs> <laughs> and this is much uh, largely self-inflicted. Yeah. I, I didn't have to be there, but I didn't really have a, a career to fall back on. I didn't have skills to fall back on. And if I would have gone back to Minnesota, it just would have been back to the moving company or back to Applebee's. Yeah. Um, and so every time I would come back into the country, I had to wonder, like, am I going to make it in? And I would practice in my head because they're, they're, they're wanting to know what you're doing there. They see you have 85 stamps going in and out of Korea. 
that, you, that you're only going to Korea, that you've always been on a tourist visa. And I mean, a couple of times they took me to a side room and they're like, what are you doing here? I'm like, um, I just, I'm, I, I'm trying to apply for university. I, I love Korea. I love the language, the food here. Uh, I'm trying to, to go to university here and it's, it's taking time to apply. And then I would talk like that, stammering, freaked out. And they're like, I don't, we don't have anything on them. And then they would stamp my passport and they would let me go. This is a reason I'm getting, I'm going on a couple tangents, but I'll bring it back. The reason I even call myself Sonny is based off all this because people will do what I was doing. Then they'll just Google their name and then they'll see like my blog teaching in Korea. And then it's like, oh, you're teaching. I can see what you're doing. So I was like, okay, I can't have my legal government name on my Facebook. Let me change it. I tried to change it to Sunnyside Films because that was like my little production company yeah. at the time. And Facebook wouldn't allow that because they're like, that's clearly not a name. Yeah. But they would let me change it to Sunnyside. And then eventually, and Sunny used to be a nickname in high school. Eventually, just everyone came to start calling me Sunny instead of instead of my real name. Because I was that like, okay, I cannot come back, have someone Google my name, and then they'll and see a picture of me teaching in a classroom and they're like, you're out. Yeah. And so... Oh, that's smart. That's getting in front of it too. Well, and that, yes. And so smart, paranoid, um, whatever you want to call it. So I just hope the wrong official doesn't listen to this because I do like Korea a lot. I want to go back. Sweet. Some Are barbecue. you still in Korea? No, I'm, I'm based out of Vietnam now. But so for the longest time, for eight years, just going back and forth, every time coming in, just being like, oh God, I hope I make it this time. And I would just have to go. You just had to get a stamp at another country. And so I would go to Japan. Um, I, eventually I got really good, uh, good at this and I figured out how to do it quickly. So I would take a train from Seoul down to Busan. That's a, a uh, maybe a three hour train ride. It's uh, 300 miles. Then I would take a ferry to, Su um, Tsushima Island. I think Tsushima Island. It takes about three hours on a ferry. I would get there, hang out for three hours and then come back. So in one day I could leave the city, go all the way to Japan and come back. And then I, I was good for another 90 days. Oh, my God. Yeah. I did that a lot. And uh, uh, more than once, it got a little scary with them wondering what I was doing there. But every time, they they still let me in. Really? So finally, um, I'm doing that. And I'm trying to figure out how to make more money. And uh, I, I know I need to get a teaching job in a classroom that's consistent, that has a salary. And so I would go to different places uh, and say, and kind of lie. I would say, oh, yeah, I have a visa. I have a teaching visa from another school but i'm just looking for extra hours so i want to work with you guys and i have experience in teaching i'm like really good at it and stuff so <laughs> and uh they go yeah just bring your visa in let's see your visa and you can work here i'd be like i don't really have a visa that sucks i don't know what to do and and so eventually what i learned was that in korea the the, the right code language to use was um i need to get paid in cash so i want to teach but i, I do need to get paid in cash so I'm and like drug dealing with grammar. That's that's like that's like saying uh, I don't want to show I don't want to show you anything. And this needs to be off the records. Right. Yeah. Right. In a clandestine way, letting them know like um, uh, if you're cool, I'm cool. Are we both cool? Yeah. And so I found a school. I was the first one to apply at this particular school at a kindergarten, and they liked my face. Um, <laughs> Korea is very big on looks. And uh, really. They, they didn't do a background check. Not that they'd have to, yeah. but they're just like, oh, you have a kind face. All right, you're hired. And so I started there and that became my full-time job for a long time in Korea. I would make uh, like 2,500 bucks a month and teach kindergarten. Is that, is that, is that a lot in Korea? Um, well, so dollars. Oh, so do the, uh, does that convert? Well, so I would say Korea is maybe like 20% cheaper than the US. It's okay. like it's like fairly similar. Taxis. I lived off 2,500 bucks as a stand-up at one point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I, at that time, I was like, okay, this is good. I mean, I've got a base salary here. I, I looked for other gigs, and I, I did other teaching stuff at the same time. But, and so are you teaching with other Americans? Um, At that particular school, so a lot of schools, you would. At that school, it was just me and then another um, Korean teacher who taught English as well. So she just mainly her and I could communicate, and that was it. Like, really? So whenever we talked about salary or anything, she would have to come translate for me with the boss. And so most people, when they go to Korea, they have everything set up. And that's what made it so much more of a, uh, an adventure, I guess, for myself. I'll look at it like an adventure now. But most people going to Korea, they have their degree. They're doing it properly. They're not trying to illegally teach English like me. Yeah. They, um, 
they have it so like when they land, it's all worked out. They have a contract. Someone picks you up at the airport. They're like, here's your dorm. Here's your room. Here's your school. Here's your classroom. You're going to work with these other 10 foreign teachers and you guys are going to be friends too. And you're going to work together and you'll probably drink together too. And this is your life for the next year. And it's kind of just set up for you where I just went and had to figure this out piece by piece. It's kind of a little bit of a theme of your life. Yeah. Yes. And, but I, I think that kind of resourcefulness and not having that option to like call a parent or just not really having anything to any backup plan is what's made me resourceful enough to kind of be where I am today. Not having a plan B is, uh, is definitely why I am. I, I listened to someone uh, on <clears throat> Instagram the other day and he goes, this guy's like, you know, who's got a plan B fucking losers. <laughs> you know, every fucking winner yes. out there rolled the dice on himself. You yeah. roll the dice on yourself. And I remember when I started comedy, I, I said, my dad said, what's your backup plan? And I said, I think if I have one, I'll do it. Yeah. Like if I have a backup plan, I'll go to it. But if I don't, then I'm kind of like, it's like, you know, burning the fucking bridge as you walk across it and going, mm. I'm on this side of the fence now. Um, I think that's, I mean, I think that's sometimes, I don't know, but I'm sure there's, I think it's the only way to succeed. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I agree. Absolutely. And I did the same thing when I started my channel. Um, is I, I moved to Vietnam and I was like, you're you're moving to Vietnam to make this channel work and you got to make it work. So and it didn't. Did, so so did what? How how soon did you start? <clears throat> when did you decide I want to do a, a travel a travel show? So before that, I, let's say I'd been in Korea for a few years and you know I'd done video production back in high school, and at this time DSLRs were coming out. There's like the big DSLR revolution because I never would have gotten into filmmaking with the crappy like video tape that they used to do yeah, yeah, like yeah. home videos with but dslrs were coming out and i started getting really into filmmaking and so my next kind of journey before the youtube channel was while being in korea figuring out how to become a videographer and a director and so i went from complete novice to doing a bunch of youtube tutorials and and really studying filmmaking and like i even made a soul filmmakers workshop I read some book that says like you need 10,000 hours of practice and you need to uh, do deliberate practice and you need like harsh feedback from people. And so I started a workshop so I could get feedback from anyone else in the community who knew more than me. Really? And, and every week I would try to rent new equipment. I would try to try uh, to use new filmmaking techniques and do whatever I could to increase my filmmaking ability. And then I would do music videos and I would kind of take on small projects and move up to bigger projects until after a couple of years, I, I ended up working for Red Bull in Korea. Um, before I left, I was working for, I did some music, like some K-pop music videos. That's, by the way, there's, uh, there's, there's, there, there's a big lesson to be learned here because Americans abroad with talent are super hireable by mm -hmm. Americans here that need to go there. Mm -hmm. And I, I, case in point, we were just in Serbia shooting my movie and they were all people that was like, yeah, I moved to Budapest. I fell in love and, but I'd done production. And so now I'm a production designer here. I'm a fucking, uh, it's, and so it's, there's companies going, our big thing were fixers. Like, I, like we always, when we went to anywhere, we'd get right. an American fixer who knew the, knew where we should go. Yeah. And or, kind of or, knew your needs, your, your like specific production needs. We had one in Japan who was absolutely beautiful. Her yeah. name, I forget her name. She was so beautiful. I mean, just gorgeous. One of the prettiest women, like physically, like we, we kind of just would stare at her and be like, God damn it, everything's right. Like <laughs> there's no mi mistakes there. She, and she was cool as shit. Yeah. She was great. Best udon noodles I've ever had right after swimming with whale sharks. It was freezing. It was stormy as shit, like 10 foot seas. Everyone was seasick. We pulled back into the bay. I forget where we were. I'm obsessed. I'm bad at remembering places I were. I was. Mm. You could, uh, but I uh, was, yeah. See, I could. We can do some conversational yeah. English. <laughs> I, it's forty five dollars an hour now, but um, but best udon. It's the first time I realized what an udon noodle was. Yeah, she kind of explained it to me. I went, oh. oh. So we, so so you were doing some production stuff in Korea. Yes, and I'd gotten to a point where I was, you know, I could make a living off it, and and finally I was like, okay, I have a sellable skill. So if I do get deported, I'm gonna go do video back in the USA. Okay, but. Um, at this time I was like, okay, I want to make my own content. And, uh, and, and I had a couple ideas for content that I could do. And I, I had two ideas specifically. I, one was called the year of fear where I was going to go around and do stuff that scared me. And, um, and then the other idea was a food show called best ever food review show. By the way, by the way, you could definitely still do year of fear. 
I yeah. would watch that. I would still watch that. I, would watch. I think, well, and so I tested them both out and the food just got well, I'll tell you the more pro- response. I'll tell you the problem with your fear is, uh, is that I, I've done shows like that. Yeah. And ultimately you end up doing stuff that's all, it's, it's all been recycled on television. Yeah. Like you get there, Bungie you, jumping. you think you, you think you've got a real, like, uh, like my, my buddy, uh, Andrew Schultz just, uh, was in Georgia and he was driving tanks over cars and everyone's like, Oh fuck, where did you find that? And then someone hit me up. They're like, Hey man, he's doing it too. And I was like, yeah, we did that on birth to conquer. You, you, there's, it's very yeah. difficult to find anything original activity wise in this mm-hmm. country um, or and abroad too. It, it gets pretty skinnied up, but food always looks original. Even if you've, you're going to the same place that Bourdain went mm. for some reason, it's always going to look unique to you, to that experience. Yeah. And everybody can relate to food in some way. Cause everybody oh, has a food. Yeah. They like, I mean, food is a, uh, a religion to most of the world in some ways. I mean, People's religion actually affects what they eat. I mean, Muslim folks eat halal food. Um, in India, there's a lot of ve- uh, vegetarians because of people who are Hindu. Um, vegans, it's another religion. I feel like I feel like Asia. This is probably going to sound ignorant. Has the most dynamic sense of flavor. Oh yeah, I, I'm I'm I, I've I've traveled a, a little bit in Asia, not enough, not a ton, mm-hmm. but the f- i mean the flavor range is so diverse whereas like in in europe in europe until you start it's 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 a bunch of bland until you get south mm-hmm. and then and then all of a sudden you're like oh here's some flavor yeah you know well so my wife is vietnamese and the first time i brought her to minnesota and we ate at like herbert's and gerbert's it's kind of just like a, a subway place big sandwich yeah. place and i mean what it's ham it was like ham turkey lettuce tomato onion mayonnaise white bread and it's just it's one note it's mayonnaise yeah like this is a mayonnaise sandwich yeah and she's just like what is this yeah how would you do this where if you go to vietnam you can get a banh mi and it's you know it's herbs and it's some kind of beautiful savory sauce with crunchy pork and to this day the best fucking sam i can tell you i can tell you where to get this sandwich i'm gonna tell you exactly where you can get this sandwich because i took the thing i love about this phone is you can go into your into your uh map and your pictures ah and i go to vietnam i had some really good like, vietnam changed my cultural dna mm. um all right the it was it was we were taking a boat in how long bay mm-hmm. i'm gonna tell you exactly where this fucking okay i'm i can tell you exactly where this let me see Yep. I wonder if you know this area. Oh, I know how long bay. So this is you, Street <laughs> Thang is where we got this sandwich. It's the best breakfast sandwich I've ever had. Uh huh. It's right across from the docks right there is where we took the boat. Okay. And the sandwich. I think I took a picture of the sandwich. Yeah. This is her making the fucking sandwich. I took a video. I don't know if it's gonna come up. This is her making the fucking right. This is the best sandwich I've ever had. This is, and by the way, I was terrified because, as you know, this is. By the way, this is exactly on the corner of, uh. Street One Thang Four, and Thang. I think it's Tang. Tang. But I would would pronounce it that way. Nui Ni Jok. New in New York. That was the best street sandwich I've ever had in my life. Yeah, and and I was terrified because she makes it out of a hot dog cart, mm-hmm. and her and <laughs> she and her eggs are all just not in a refrigerator, they're just yeah. sitting in a bowl. And then she makes. I, I want to say she cooks the eggs under, and then oh yeah, like the, in a tiny little skillet on a gas yeah on a gas range. And she and then she put um some some little pork shavings in it, and two fried eggs, and some sauce, and uh, and she cooked the fried eggs perfectly so they were runny but they were a little thick runny you know like they were perfect mm. and so i got it and i forced one of my cameramen to take a bite with me because i was like we're definitely getting sick and i took a bite and i went back and i said can i get 13 of those and she, <laughs> she was like huh i said oh, all the bread all your bread I, and i bought 13 of them mm-hmm. and uh 
and she made 13 and I ran them out to the boat. We were getting on a boat to go into Halong Bay and I gave them to every one of my crew and I said, I just want to see the look on your face when you taste the sandwich. And everyone was like, this is the greatest sandwich I've ever had. And then I found out pretty much anyone, any of those street vendors that made those sandwiches made them pretty fucking awesome. Mm. And we would go to bars and I would see one and I'd run down and I'd buy 13 of them. I'd go, I want all your bread. Just start making them and I'll come back. I'll take all of them. Mm. And I couldn't, I, I mean, I had a problem with those. Yeah, and they cost a dollar. They or, cost a or dollar. Maybe not even a dollar. I, 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 if I go back to Vietnam, I will do, try to find that lady. It was that good. I remember thinking, this is the best breakfast sandwich I've ever had in my entire fucking life. Mm-hmm. And the bread, and I don't know yeah. if it's because of the water, but the bread is so light. Well, it's because they use rice flour. They're not using wheat flour. Really? Or, or they're using a mix. But the rice flour gives it a little bit different consistency. And of course, those you know personal baguettes were influenced from the French when they yeah. were in Vietnam. But the recipe itself is you know it's kind of that mix of French influence, but using the the ingredients they have in Vietnam. So our our best friends are Vietnamese. Our we have four fa- three families that we hang out with. We call ourselves mm-hmm. campers. And my wife and her, and our, our I, I would say we're all close, but one of the families is Vietnamese from v- Vietnam. The the mom is Chinese Vietnamese, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. She was Chinese. Her family immigrated to Vietnam, but they're uh, they're ethnically Chinese, right? And then they had to take a boat here from for, from the, after the Vietnam War. And my buddy, I've had my buddy on the podcast. My buddy is Vietnamese. His mom is a very famous Vietnamese lady who wrote a book called "When Heaven and Earth Change Places." Hmm. Oliver Stone optioned the rights, and they made a movie out of it. And uh, she has, if you see the movie or read the book, it's. Her experience during the Vietnam War was absolute. I mean, I remember one time trying to connect with her, and I was like, "Like, if you if you think back to the Vietnam War, like, what was the worst part for you?" And she goes, "I have so many." She goes, "How about my brother being thrown out of a helicopter above our village?" Yeah, and I was like, "That happened." And she was like, "Yeah, how about snakes?" Yeah, I mean, me getting tied up and snakes being put down my dress, and mm-hmm. I was like, "Okay, never mind. Let's go. Let's go back." Well, so one thing about Vietnam is that. um Sadly, that's all Americans have, you know, because for every country, if you say a country, we have like maybe two, three ideas about that country based on popular culture. And for Vietnam, Mm. it's still Vietnam War. And you go to Vietnam and you talk to Vietnamese people and they couldn't give a fuck less. They're like, move on, dude. And so like Americans want to go there and be like, are they going to be mad because I'm American? It's like they moved on so quickly. And um, like they just have like such a healthy um mentality there of like let's focus on the future yeah like, that's in the past we're not going to hold what happened uh, like and terrible atrocities happened there and they're terrible not going to hold that against americans going there now that what's 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 great about um well what's tough we we were doing a trip flip was one of my shows where i take people two people on adventures of a lifetime and vietnam was a destination mm-hmm. and i tried we were in cleveland and i tried to take cute couples to vietnam I'd be like you guys are you guys adventurous? Yeah. You guys do anything? You pick it up right now and you're ready to go. And they're like, we'll go right now. I go, first class trip. We pay for everything. And they're like, we're in, we're in, we're in. We're like, all right, we're going to Vietnam. And I remember one dude going, we're going to Nam? And I was like, no, it's not. We're not going to Nam. Right. Uh... Yeah. And so if my videos in Vietnam could do anything, I hope it's showing people just how just uh, uh, hospitable and generous and kind oh. people are there. And, and it, it is, it's, um, it's just such a, a nice vibe there. It's amazing. It's beautiful Vietnam geography is... and just some of the best food you've ever had in your life. I have some criticisms on Vietnam. Number one is trash maintenance. Okay. <laughs> they just and burn it work. on the side of the road. <laughs> there's some work to be done. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, the fact that when you cross traffic, you're just supposed to stay at that same pace or they will hit you with a car. Oh, see, I like that part. I like that. I like that. I don't want to just have to wait at red lights. You yeah. just go. You just and go you just, and you're ready. And the, the whole point is don't speed up. They're anticipating your movement. Yeah. So you go at your pace. They'll go at their pace. Uh-huh. You need to trust each other. It's such an interesting mix of culture where the stranger strangers communicate through movement. Oh, which, yeah. Which would never happen in this country. No, because every here, you're both at a stop sign and you're like, no, you go. No, you go. Yeah. No, you go. And then. You stay there 45 minutes later, like, are you sure? Okay, I'll go. The tra- We rode motorcycles through um, through Saigon. Where, where did, uh, where did, and I, the only reason I remember this, I remember we got our ears cleaned. Uh, oh. <laughs> dude, that's the greatest thing I've ever I, fucking uh, done. I have, I have done that. I, I think it's fake. 
What? No. Oh, pull up, pull up ear, but Burr Kreischer ear. Wait, ear. did they do the bur- ear candling? No. The candling Oh my is God, fake. hold on. Hold on. This is where, this is the great, this is, so my buddy who's Vietnamese is like, when you go, you got to get your ears cleaned. He goes, they cleaned my ears and they found a cockroach in my ear. Shut and he goes, and they got it out and I didn't know it had been in there for a while. And he goes, I couldn't hear it. Burt Kreischer ear cleaning. Do you think they, Vietnam. maybe they put it in there? Like when cops know. put a little cocaine baggie in your car? <laughs> It would be and brilliant like, if they did. Hey, look what we found. We'll, we're going to put it back in if you don't pay us 100 bucks. Start, start, start. There we go. Okay. So we rode motorcycles through. This is, by the way, this is the best hosting I've ever done, for the record, okay? So this is right. This particular episode? This No, this just a segment. This episode. Was, oh, okay. Episode was good, but, you know, ultimately, I think it's none of, anyway. Okay. My travel channel, my hosting and travel channel was just not who I was. It was, it was just, and it was, I was trying to be someone else and I didn't know how to do it. And I was just like, and every time I tried to be myself, they would just be like, don't, don't do that. Don't yeah, do that. Too much. All right. Are you having, are you having slow internet, Halston? Yeah. Can I tell you something? Yeah. We have faster internet in Vietnam than you have in LA. Uh, yeah. Halston, what's going on here? <laughs> every TV. podcast I listen to that's out of California, it's like, ah, uh, never mind. Yeah. Skype calls that just drop. The guy, they put these, they go in and they cleaned out Tootsie Rolls out of this dude's ear. Oof. Tootsie Rolls. This is the greatest. This was right by um, the the guy that ran for president, McCain, crashed in a lake. Yeah. is that? And then they pulled him, they dragged him through the city during the war. That lake, we rode motorcycles around that lake. Wow. Um, but riding motorcycles in, in Saigon was fucking it's an experience in and of itself. Yeah, I've done a few like few day trips on on a motorbike really through, through the countryside. It's great. I mean, oh. it's, it's gorgeous, and you you don't get the same feeling if you're just in a van or something looking no. out the window. Like you're sur- you're surrounded by rice paddies. If you go to Haiyang, if you go way in the north, almost by the Chinese border, I mean, you are in some very remote villages where they still probably have faster internet than you have here. But yeah, yeah. But they are way out. Like they're doing everything by hand. They're sowing the rice fields by hand, and they have gorgeous wood houses that mm. they built themselves. It's it's stunning. So beautiful. One of the uh, we j- I just talked about it on. That's th- what they pulled out of his fucking ear. You're not if you're not gonna get it up. Don't worry about it. Um, what's remarkable? I just want to say this. What's really remarkable about those places, and this is something I try to capture too, is there's this idea sometimes a little too much in the U.S. that the U S is the best and our lifestyle is the best and it has to be modern and we have to have all this uh, cool shit. But then you go to a place like that and I'm talking about, they built their own house. They're growing all their, their produce and, and, and everything by hand themselves. These people are happy, legitimately happy. Yeah. And they don't have a bunch of extra shit, but they have everything they need. And the only thing I could think, you know, here and there probably, you know, medical could be better, but they're healthy. Um, they have a community. Uh, they they don't have like high suicide rates or anything like that. Yeah, it's um it's really much more how humanity is supposed to live. I, I I would totally agree, and I feel like I feel like there's something to be said for, you know, we we stayed at a farm stay, and mm-hmm. uh, I don't know where. I could, actually I can tell you, we stayed at a farm stay, in um, let's see. It was, it had to be, God, man, I didn't move around too much in Vietnam, did I? Oh, maybe I did. Were you, so you were, that video looked like Hanoi. So you're mainly in the north, I'm guessing. Like Hanoi, then you took a day trip to Halong Bay. No, we were, we did, we went everywhere. We took a fucking train somewhere. Oh, really? Yeah, we went to uh, Tan Ho. Is that it? Tan Ho? Is that where the farm stay is? I think so. We took a train down there. That was where the train went, and maybe we went further. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We went down to Dong Hoi. Is that hmm. something? I don't know. Okay, my my wife knows. I had a great experience with this older Vietnamese lady who saw me on a walk and just came over and wanted to hold my hand and walk with me. Oh, that's beautiful. And it was out of this world. But we stayed at a farm store, farm stay in Dong Hoi, and it was awesome. That's where I just talked about this on Rogan. I was on a motorcycle running through rice paddies i was drunk i was high and i was fucking just i, I was listening to the doors i think and i was just like like f- just in my element and mm-hmm. we weren't we weren't filming it we were done filming and i was doing this and rogan called and he was like what are you doing 
I just was caught off guard. I was like, oh, I'm drunk. I'm high on a motorcycle running through rice paddies in Vietnam. And he was like, <laughs> holy shit. He was yeah. like, dude, you got to stop doing this fucking show and just start talking about that shit on stage. He was like, yeah. you're so much better on stage. And mm. But it was, it was, uh, it was, it was just so, I don't know, everything. I, I, I have such a, an affinity for Vietnam because mm -hmm. I, it, it really changed who I was. It, it allows you to gain a little. And I'm curious to know what, what you feel has changed about yourself traveling so much in asia from the kid like when you go back to the kid you were in in minnesota mm -hmm. what you, what differences you see well i never could have done this show if i just went from minnesota to vietnam and just yeah. started shooting right i had to like kind of all my experiences even teaching english uh to a classroom because you have to kind of direct a classroom to video directing um all these weird parts different parts of my life kind of culminated in what I'm doing now, including living in Korea. So I, I think just I had to live in another culture for so long to finally understand how other cultures are different and to not approach it from like a cynical um, American point of view where it would just be kind of mocking them. Yeah. And so now I feel Which like- Which is very easy. Yes. It's a very easy angle to mock something. And now I feel like I've found a nice line where I've been in Asia so long that I know what stuff, um, I don't know how to describe this. Some, the way I treat people when I'm with people is like they're a buddy. I don't treat them with this kind of reverence, like, oh my gosh, you're like so much better than me. I kind of like, I feel like we should, I should treat them like a peer. And sometimes I get a little too comfortable. And sometimes people take that the wrong way and they think maybe I'm being rude or something. Um, but I, I've never had the people I'm actually with interpret it that way or get offended. Yeah. It's just, you know, people, you hang out with someone for a whole day that gets chopped into a five minute video and people don't see the full context that you got there early. You said, thank you. You yeah. did all this stuff. They just see like these quick interactions in a video. So there's that. Um, but I think I had to be in Asia for a long time to, to know when to say something is unusual or, or how to say it's unusual, but not just be like, this is disgusting. Um, I can kind of explain how something is different without just being like uh, completely judgmental about it. It's interesting. You, I think, I would. I know that I, I've traveled a, b a bunch, but I've lived abroad now. I was just there for three months, and there's a humility to not knowing the language, mm -hmm. not being familiar with the currency, not being like just getting your. I tried to get avocados in uh, Serbia, and I fucked it up so bad mm -hmm. that I had to have a man, a grown man, yeah. who would never have done this, and this wouldn't happen in L.A. Take me over and show me how to get avocados. Yeah. Because you, what you had to do is you had to type them in. You had to get your avocados. You had to weigh them. You had to type in what was on the scale. Mm. Then you had to get that price. Then you had to put them in a bag and put the price on the bag. And then give them the lady, which makes total sense. You yeah, know? but here you just, I make this mistake all the time yeah. too. Because I'll bring, I'll get all my produce. And I'm like, why aren't you weighing it in here for me? Yeah. And they're like, no, you got to go. You have to, you have to walk 10 minutes back to where you got all that stuff. Weigh it, get stickers and come back. I was, and I, I would get so worked up. Like, and I remember my my cousin was with me and we would just make simple mistakes. Like, oh, I guess we brought heavy goat milk cream Oops. instead of milk. Right. I'm like, oh, I think this is going to be rich cereal this week. <laughs> but uh, but it's it does give you a humility and it allows you. It allows you to be introspective when you travel. Mm -hmm. it, allow, it forces you to 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 be super quiet inside yourself and nervous and on which you don't get that in, in the States. You go to a new city and you're just like, hey, where you guys don't have hot sauce? Right. And whereas, like, you're in a different city, you're like, is it rude if I ask for salt? Mm -hmm. <laughs> not in Serbia. Everything's fucking salty as shit in Serbia. Right. I, you do not need salt in Serbia. But, um, so, so you, how, so I'm curious, I wanna know about the growth of this channel because your, your channel, I think you have like 2.8 million subscribers. Yeah. And, and your channel is fucking huge. But I'm curious on the pivot. Because the thing I found the most connecting with you, mm -hmm. I've done this a lot, and I have regretted it ever since, is every time I've ever done it, is both me and you have a tad bit of a chip on our shoulder of of our experience with Travel Channel. And I, mm -hmm. I love those guys. I don't have, a, like, I, I'm glad of my past experience, but there was a thing about not, like, not getting, uh, my buddy Zane Lamprey could tell you the same thing. Uh, there's a lot of guys, down, the, every guy that worked for Travel Channel never got the Bourdain treatment, which mm -hmm. is you do what you want to do. Yeah. We're going to let you do what you want to do. And that is why people will love you. Mm. A lot of times we got the, 
hey, we got hands on the pie. I, I need you to do this. I need you to say this. This is what we need out of you. So I want to know how long you would. When did you start? Do you shooting? want to know how I got the pilot? I want to know. I want. To, were you doing your own thing before the pilot? Yeah. Okay. So take me through all of it. Is it okay if I sip a, a little bit of Red Bull? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Is this yeah. dinner? Is this not? Babe, can you bring me a little bit of Red Bull? Gotta stay sharp. Yeah. Oh, is that what it was? It's still not working. Um. So. So. Okay. So. Excuse me. Did you start the channel in Vietnam or in? I started in, it while I was in Korea. Okay. And so I filmed a couple episodes in Korea. By yourself? And so I always had at least one camera guy friend who would go with me. Okay. And I would film half of it and he would film half of it. Basically, he's filming everything where I'm on screen and I'm filming, filming pretty much everything else, all the B-roll and so on. And so early on, I went to Taiwan. I went to the Philippines. I did some stuff in Korea. And then I took to, a trip to Vietnam. Just this is all by chance of this happened so i just found cheap flights i had a friend who's like hey if you shoot during these five days i'll go with you and i'll film with you just pay for my travel stuff it's like boom deal. let's do it i can knock out a bunch of episodes around this time i have like fifteen thousand subscribers mm -hmm. not much <clears throat> but what are you what are you posting up until this point just your own everyday life and no no Korea? so it's still food videos i mean uh -huh. the very very beginning of the channel was me doing like a western food in korea and then at some point I was like, okay, I got to pivot. Who yeah. cares about nachos in Korea? What am I doing? Yeah. So then I, I wanted to, I basically. By the way, by the way, first episode of Something's Burning, Korean nachos. Is that right? My, yeah, I have, a, I have a food show called Something's Burning. Oh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, the first episode we did, we didn't know how we were going to do this. And Al Madrigal's wife's Korean. And he goes, uh, this is a recipe for Korean nachos. And so we just made Korean nachos for Bill Burr and Tom Segura. And it got, it got huge numbers. And we were like, all right. We're off. Korea's hot right now. Korea's, by the way. It, it yeah. was not in 2008. Yeah. But I, I'm, I'm happy to see it because Korean food is awesome. Oh, Korean fucking food is. Well, my buddy, one of my buddies is a, is a Korean dude named Roy Choi. He kind of reinvented the taco truck. Mm -hmm. He was, he took Korean, he made Korean barbecue taco fusion mm -hmm. and it fucking blew up. Mm -hmm. So we have, but uh, so I'm sorry. So you were shooting content. Well, so I, I took a trip to Vietnam. Yeah. And I was just supposed to be there for a week. But when I was there, I met a tour company who was like, hey, if you work with us and you make some videos for us, we will give you a salary and we'll give you a camera guy. And I had a little bit of savings, but not like maybe like 10 or 15 grand. Yeah. And I was like, all right, I'm going to go for it. So talking about like kind of burning the boats, like taking a risk, like going all in. This was like my second time going all in. The first time was going to Korea. Now I'm like, I'm going to Vietnam and I'm going to make this channel work. So you're so you straight up moved to Vietnam. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I so love it. This company paid me a thousand bucks a month. That's it. A thousand okay. bucks a month. And then they supplied me with a camera guy. That, that was part of their team. Yeah. So so for my shoots, I could use him to, to help me shoot. Yeah. And um, so from there, I mean, it was a long journey to, uh, to, to kind of get the channel going. And I don't think I would have done it if I didn't move to Vietnam. But right before moving to Vietnam, this was so crazy. The travel channel reached out to me in an email and they said, we're interested in doing something with now, you. What year we want to make a sizzle reel. This is 2015, I believe. 2015. So I'm trying to think who the president was then. Do you remember? Uh, yeah, that was still um, Barack. Barack. No, no. The <laughs> the president. They say the president. Oh, <laughs> the president of travel channel. Yeah. Oh, do they have a president over there? I thought yeah. they had an emperor. No. who Do you know who you dealt with? <laughs> I can't say. I got that one wrong. That's funny. 2015. No, I've never known who the president of any network is. I don't care. Hold on. Uh, well, no, that's it's. Well, it's interesting. 2015. What was I doing in 2015? I can tell you what episode of what show. Vietnam was in 2014, so it was not. You didn't deal with Laureen. You were dealing with. Um, I think it was. It was. Yeah, it was as they were getting ready to transition. I think they knew they were going to be leaving script soon. Mm. And they were going to be, um, so you were kind of in between you were in, you, you got, I, I always wondered what happened to your show. Okay. I'll tell you what happened to your show. Yeah. I was right in between the, the handoff, right? I mean, yeah. it went no, from no, no, it wasn't, discovery, even, it, wasn't no? it wasn't even the handoff. There was a period where they didn't have a president. They oh just, yeah. There was a period where they didn't have a president. And that is when you made your show. And I was doing birth, the conqueror season three at that time. And you could, you kind of were allowed to do whatever you wanted, but you had to realize that they were getting a new president yeah. and that president was going to kill everything that had come in mm -hmm. because it wasn't theirs. Right. And so uh, there was a great dude who used to work. I forget his name. 
It's a great dude who used to work at Golf Channel. He was there 2014, and I think he left 2015. And then I think all the people at Scripps that were over at DIY and cooking came over and started running Travel Channel. They're still over at Travel Channel. Mm -hmm. Those are the kind people that uh, let me go out of my contract. Uh, oh, that's yeah. nice. <laughs> and, I, and by the way, I had resentment about that for the longest time. I'm so grateful that I'm so grateful that they saw I wasn't right for the network because mm -hmm. I was not right for the network. Yeah. I'm so grateful because now I'm so fucking happy yeah. that I go, but I'm, but I, for a long time said shitty things like just going like, I don't know. You just, I know you feel this, but when you get an opportunity and you feel like you maybe weren't given the shot that you deserved and then you succeed, mm. there is a little bit of like, of going like, kiss my ass I, yeah kiss my ass yeah. syndrome where you kiss my ass and i've just got past kiss my ass syndrome i just recently just recently like last weekend uh knows when when i did um when i did um uh, this is gonna sound really crazy when i watched your uh confessional one-on-one -on -one, yeah and i saw you talk about travel channel i just kept thinking to myself he's so lucky that he didn't work with him he's mm. so fucking lucky absolutely like, he's so so lucky and then I thought to myself, okay, hold on, Bert. Mm. I saw myself in you a mm -hmm. lot because I have said what you said verbatim on this podcast. How many times, Halston? So, so many fucking times. Mm -hmm. And when I saw you say it, I went, oh, my God, I, I do that all the time. I did I do that all the fucking time. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what the fuck is wrong with me? Because and then and then this is hardcore secret time is I then decided I was going to do nothing but celebrate everything because that's who I am. I love to celebrate shit. Mm -hmm. And I went on Rogan and I didn't even realize it cognizantly. I didn't make an effort, but I just found in situations where I could have, like we talked about Travel Channel and I just celebrated that experience. Mm -hmm. And then we talked about like Joe Schilling and I celebrated Joe Schilling. Whitney Cummings, I celebrated. I would never talk shit about Whitney. These are my friends, Brendan Schaub. All these people are my friends, but I made sure to take a second to celebrate how much I liked them. Mm -hmm. And everyone hit me up like Jocko Wilnick hit me up this morning and he was like, hey man, I'd love to do a podcast with you if you're ever in San Diego. Thanks mm. for the kind words on Rogan or whatever he said. And I was like, I was like, oh, because what happens when you get successful? And I witnessed this with you because mm. your your channels one of the one of the biggest I think biggest travel shows on all of YouTube. I'll and, go with that. Yeah, and is <laughs> definitely one of the best by far. Thank by you. By fucking far. Thank you. And 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 I'm not shitting on Fun for Louie or Ben Brown, all these guys that I <clears throat> have been fans of, but yours is compartmentalized it really is um it really is a straight up travel show and you're mm -hmm. not you're not saying I, I want you to see how cool my life is which mm -hmm. is a what a lot of bloggers do right and and I'm, by the way i'm also guilty of that i'm not shitting on bloggers i've done that too but you start all of a sudden you're filming yourself getting standing ovations and you're like who's this for <laughs> mm. but like uh but it's a it's it is a fucking traditional respectful tr like like fucking done well, shot beautifully, lots of personality, and fucking very consumable. Like yeah. I took in, I don't know how many episodes, but it was that it was that one confessional thing, and I was like, oh my god, I've done that mm. so many times, and I was like, you're so much better having not, you know, the, the amount of views that they get per show is nothing compared to what you get per video. Right. It's right. I mean, not, I mean, if they had what you got per video, I mean. It would that would it won't exist. It, would, it right. wouldn't exist. It just wouldn't exist. It's just not possible. It's, it was impossible. Not that many people look at that network to, to to or any of those networks right to get what the views you're getting. Mm -hmm. And it's and so it's kind of like mm, what are you gonna do, yeah. right? But uh, but so tell me how you got the pilot. Um, first of all, thank you for the nice words. Did I listen to your open tabs podcast yeah. where you where you said nice things too? So really appreciate that. That's awesome, no, especially coming from you. I was like. That was like, that totally made my week. So thank you. No, of course. Um, it's so funny because I had just seen you at Red Rocks in Colorado. And then two days later, I was watching the open tabs thing. And I was like, this is crazy. I was just yeah. at this show. Oh, I, I, you said I just saw you at Red Rocks. And I was like, oh my God, I would have loved to have you backstage. I wish I had known. I would have fucking had you backstage. How I out party. We had to stay at Red Rocks oh, instead of waiting God. for traffic. I know. We just stayed at Red Rocks until like midnight. <sighs> okay, next time. Next time. Um. So what happened, the, the funniest thing about getting the... Uh, the pilot is, so I was in Korea when they first messaged me and they wanted to do a, what do they call it? A, a buzz? A no, sizzle. a sizzle. Yeah. yeah, a sizzle reel. They're like, we're going to interview you. And I was so bad because like they just take you out of your element. 
And because they think every host should be this plug and play kind of like, all right, here's the camera and here's the lights and here's the food. Go. Like, I don't, this isn't interesting. So they sat me at my computer and I did my best. And I, I, they asked me all these questions and I'm trying to be energetic. And uh, it was so flat. And they were like, all right, we'll, uh, we'll do it again. We'll do, actually, let's just do some lines and you go out and answer these questions as you would on your show. So they finally made a sizzle that got, uh, accepted for the next round. Do you remember the person you were doing it with? Was her name Anna? So I worked with High Noon Entertainment. Uh, do you remember who you worked with at High Noon? Oh, um, gosh, what was her name? She was great. Stacy was name. she Jewish? I forgot her name. I remember. Lori. I remember the showrunner, and I remember the president, and then I forgot her name. Yeah, I worked at High Noon for uh, four years. Okay, so I know of High Noon very well. I've hired a lot of their, uh, a lot of the people that work at High Noon hmm. worked at High Noon to do my. I'm doing uh, stuff on the road when we go on tour mm -hmm. and shooting it. And I've hired a lot of high noon people and, and citizen people also, also based out of Colorado. Yeah, I, I love high noon. Oh, God, I want to know who you fucking worked with. Um, I can look it up later. I'll text Stacy. Okay. It, it was, I don't, it was a generic white chick name. I'm not sure. Uh, I, 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 can, I guarantee it was, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, so it, this, it was somebody who had done research. And what's funny is the way they found me, because my channel was, really tiny when they found me under 20 under 17,000 subscribers so it was really early on and I, I couldn't believe this was happening because I had I had no experience um I was still like just kind of figuring out what the show is how to be a host and um eventually like a, a year later I asked them by the way I never asked but how did you guys find me and they go oh well, there's a there's a blog about the top 10 travel creators and actually it's you weren't in the top 10 but in the comments down below somebody said hey Guys, you should check out this show. It's kind of travel and comedy. It's called the Best Ever Food Review Show. The name of the person who left that comment, Sonny. It was me. It was me from like a year and a half earlier who had written this comment trying to advertise my own show. Yeah. And that is how she found my channel and found me. And then that led to the pilot. So I did the sizzle. I can't believe how many steps it takes. Was her name her Callie? To be on TV. I can't remember her name. <laughs> I was, I'm going through my list going, it's got to be, it's, I keep going. You know, they did the same thing with Eddie Wong. You know who Eddie Wong is? Yeah. And they did the same thing with Eddie Wong is they got him and they tried to do this plug and play thing. And he was like, and I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was high noon too. Mm. And he was like, yo, man, I do like what I do. You can't just put me into like, right. you know? Well, that's why since then, everybody who's asked me about hosting, I say, yeah, um, I'm interested if I can direct. And then they're out. So that's fine. Can I tell you, I'm actually only interested in directing. Yeah, comics. I, I have said to I've said to everyone to anyone that wants to put a comic into a hosted reality show, hosted, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is we do. I said I can definitely get them out of their way because I know how comics. Mm. I know I know the tricks that comics get in their way with. Yeah, and that is getting over prepared the night before and having a ton of fucking jokes that'll never make the show mm. and not listening and not engaging and not being interested. Like there's so many things comics do because they think, well, oh, I got to be funny. So yeah, I, I find that I would love to direct. Um, and I, well, I've directed hundreds of my own episodes. Yeah. What's funny is they'll look at my episode and be like, oh, he's a great host. It's like, no, it's good. Cause I'm a good director. Yeah. I directed those scenes for me, because I knew that those were scenes that like I would flourish and I'd do well and I'd perform well in. So the the steps are broken down so much. First, they're like, well, we're going to fly you out and shoot like half a pilot. I forgot the names for all this stuff. There's some special name. And so like a proof of concept or something. Mm -hmm. So I fly out to um, Florida, I think. Yeah, we shot in Florida. So we shoot like 10 minutes of footage over a couple of days. I'm freaking nervous and freaking out. I'm so new at this stuff. Yeah, I do it. And they go, okay, they love that. Food Network wants a pilot and Travel Channel wants a pilot. This never happens. And I was like, what is going on? This yeah. is so crazy. And so from there, um, this is where the lawyers got in the way. Can I get like into some details of course. here? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I don't know. To me, this stuff is interesting, but I've just ever, I would never just talk about it on a Q&A. Fucking on, fascinating. On my channel. So um, I'm pumped. And then they go, all right, so here's the contract. And just sign the contract and then, you know, we're going to do the pilot soon and then you'll hang out for a year and then it'll be on TV. And in the meantime, you just can't do YouTube or anything else. I'm sorry, what? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You have to quit social media. Mm -hmm. Like, okay. So I already knew they were very antiquated and they, they in the wanna, way they work. They want to be in control of your digital footprint. Yeah, no, no, thank you. And yeah. so I was like, there's no chance I'm doing that. I freaking moved to Vietnam, not just to sit here for a year 
well, you guys figure out if this, like how to edit a pilot and put it on TV. Yeah. And so we went back and forth and the, I, this is the problem with lawyers is that they should only be talking to other lawyers and not real people because yeah. she was using her lawyer brain to go. She's like, well, I'll see, but usually they don't allow that. Cool. Then I'm out. What do you yeah. mean? Okay. Then bye. So we go back and forth. Eventually I'm, I just stopped writing them. And I, I wrote to the showrunner. I go, Hey man, I love to work with you guys, uh, with you and you guys are, are great. I'm, it's not my dream to be on TV. I love what I'm doing already. I'm not willing to give it up. So what they did, and they never do this because uh, uh, what they did is they helped me find an agent. That is not in their favor at all. No, not because at all. they don't want you to have an agent because that means you have like negotiating power. What they want, and and I don't fault High Noon for this. This is just the business. Mm -hmm. Whatever. That's it. How uh, it's how it works. So they they want you to sign a bunch of contracts and be excited and be like, I'm going to be a TV star. I'm going to sell pans eventually and spatulas, and. Um, and so they give me, they gave me Andrew Zimmern's agent. Really? I talked to him one time for a 20 minute phone call. He told me everything he's going to do. They do this thing. I don't know how detailed I should get, but they do, do they do this thing where they're like, well, we want a percentage of all the shows you come up with and stuff you sell for like the next three years. And we just kind of feel like we're the ones who launched you. And, um, and so we just want a piece of that. And Which so, one? High noon, high, high noon or? Yeah, you know, high noon. Oh. And so. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I don't know if I'm going to get. No, 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 no. That's, right. uh, by the way, hold on. I, and that is. That is a lot of a lot of production companies. Um, it, it is a proprietary thing. They feel like they found you. They feel like they launch you. And I know for a fact, and and just so that we're all uh, being a, above board, if we're spilling tea, like I had that problem with um, with my first production company who produced mm -hmm. Birth Conqueror. They discovered me. They brought me to Travel Channel, and then Travel Channel took me and moved me to High Noon. Mm. And they were like, hey, what the fuck? And I was like, well, it's just, I guys, I have a job at Travel Channel. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, but we're the ones that got you the job. Like, and, mm. and, 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 you know, my guys had done Man vs. Food, and then they did Birth Conquer. Birth Conquer was like second highest rated show Travel Channel had ever had. Mm. And, uh, and fresh for like a launch of a series, I think. And then High Noon, then Travel Channel just kind of pulled me out from them and moved me to High Noon. And and I remember and I'm still really good friends with everyone over at the initial company. Shout out to yeah. Dan. And so, uh, but the, the, but it was kind of shit. It, it is kind of those production companies start protecting themselves in that way. That going like, well, if we launch you, if you start doing more shows, we want to have a piece of those shows. I yeah, and I so I understand all of that. The the whole like you can't be on YouTube is dumb and yeah. antiquated. And I think more. Hopefully more networks are stopping that because it doesn't actually help them in any ways. No. But so I'm talking to the agent and I go, yeah, what do you think about this percentage? It's pretty high. What do you, I think we could get it down to this percent. He goes, oh, I'm just going to do away with that completely. I was like, that's an option. <laughs> I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know we could do that. <laughs> and so he gets all my stuff worked out quick. And finally it's like, all right, it's on. We're going to do two pilots. So we shot the pilots back to back. Um, one was in Florida. One was in the Bahamas. To be honest, I wish they would have di differentiated the themes a little bit because it just ended up being the same show. Yeah. On it just was like we shot two episodes of a season and yeah. they put one on Food Network and one on Travel Channel. And then like, uh, or maybe they ended up putting them both on travel. I think that's what happened. Um, and so it didn't get picked up. You you shed some light as to why. You you were th you and, were basically thrown to the fucking wolves. And the process takes forever. It's so disheartening. And so my channel in that time had grown so much. And you know what's interesting? Um, oh, I talked about this. I think you saw this in the video already, but like I went to go shoot the pilot. I'm hanging out with camera guys and producers and showrunners, and I'm just asking them questions nonstop. I'm like, yeah. I need to learn everything you guys do. And I remember telling my girlfriend at the time, my now wife and people from my team, hey, one year from now, we're going to operate how these guys operate. Yep. And so they have, I mean, they have the, the call sheet when you get there and it's got emergency numbers and weather and all these details. Like Social I want it hospital, to hospital the, the yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah, and not just that, but I go, I wanted a year from now that my team, I'm ready to go on a trip. And they're like, here's your flights. Here's the hotel. Here's our itinerary. Every day is scheduled from beginning to end. Here's what you're shooting. Here's ideas for topics. Like we would have gone through that, you know, already, but everything's just set. And then I just go and do my job mm -hmm. and host the show and direct the show. And that's what happened. And so, yes, I am thankful for having that experience. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. And it's a masterclass in production. Absolutely. Because I'll tell you that there's right now, and, and just we're being honest, High Noon is 
fucking amazing production company mm -hmm. and they fucking i've all I, every, I, everything i learned was from high noon oh and i work with matt walker the showrunner like he and i'm very high strung yeah and um like i and that's why i like directing i'm just busy the whole time i'm very engaged i know how i want things shooting a pilot was really hard because i would get to the location and they need two hours to set up before i interview anybody so usually it's like half an hour. We get there. I'm like, you get exteriors, oh, you get interiors. This stuff in forever. And and in the time I've been waiting two hours, I've had the interview in my head six times. By the time I sit down to interview, my brain is like roasted. I'm yeah. like, I can't. Uh, my performances were so bad. Don't get me started. Don't get me fucking now. Now this is where you're gonna get me upset. So one of the things that I could not fucking deal with was most production companies will have talents call time along with camera sound mm, and everyone else right. and i was like hold on i am not i don't need to set anything up right. in order i know how long it takes to build a camera okay so for everyone uh, unaware cameras aren't all just ready to go right. you got to build your cameras uh sounds got to connect audio to these cameras they've got it there's a lot of work that gets done when the production company gets to when the produ the team gets to the location and usually it takes about two hours mm. for them to get all up and running, go in, do like a scout. The camera guys need to scout. They need to see if there needs to be lights in there. There's a big fucking thing. And so if you're talent, you're sitting in a van for two hours, just literally drinking coffee, getting like, okay, I'm fucking wired. Let's go. Mm -hmm. And then you get in there and you shoot for like 20 minutes and then you're done. And they're like, all right, new location. And you're like, fuck. And so my thing was, I was always always fighting and it's selfish but for my call time to be i wanted I, this sounds horrible i wanted everyone waiting for me yeah well so if you come on time if they're not actually waiting for you but if you come on time and you're ready to go and they're ready to go it's that's it's gonna make a better product and it's better for everybody so i don't think that's selfish oh i i, I have a phone number i could call in right here that <laughs> of someone who was like you were i was a i used to tell people i'm a pain in the fucking ass because they're in order to get my best performance i should be well rested i mean like that's mm -hmm. I, like you wouldn't do that to the cameraman but you know but like and so i used to have uh, but but you're also on such a small crew yeah. that they sometimes they don't have a van right now i know there's producers mm -hmm. especially at high noon listening to this going god damn it bert you're a prima donna and you, we all know that they're they don't have not anyone can just grab a van and go pick me up and sometimes locations yeah. are an hour away sure. from where the hotel are there are a lot of complications but i know that was fucking my bone of contention mm. for so fucking long. So Travel Channel can easily look online and go, oh, here's 10 examples of travel shows on YouTube that people watch. Why can't they figure out the formula for themselves? I Because I, I got I to gotta be honest with you. I think that travel is different than other than other things. I think when Travel Channel was a was a was a a home to travel. It was a destination channel. Mm -hmm. And that was because ultimately of Bourdain and, and Adam Richman mm -hmm. and, and Andrew Zimmern. And I mean, I'm sure I'm leaving people out. Sam Brown. There's a lot of names that I could list, list on this, but they were destination. People would tune in and it would inspire them to travel. And I think maybe when Bourdain left or, or when Adam switched, like there was a, there was a kind of a watering down of the brand where people and the internet started exploding. And now when people, want to travel it's they're more specific about it hmm. like i think i know for a fact like i know where i'm going i've watched i watched this great dude do a travel blog of um charleston west virginia it's a really fucking guy knows his shit mm -hmm. and i was like oh yeah because i'm going to charleston west virginia mm -hmm. anyone going to asia is going to find you and be like oh shit i want that right like and and i think what happened is and, and i'm a hundred percent i have no right talking about this but i think that the brand got kind of broad stroked out mm -hmm. where it was like i think they got a little away i fucking this i should not be talking about this i don't know i think they got away from personalities right yeah i think they got away from the bourdain the zimmern the sam brown the personalities and the personality is what sold the show. Yeah. I mean, Man versus Food was a great premise. But without Adam Richman, who is, hands down, one of the greatest fucking hosts I've ever seen work, mm -hmm. without a fucking doubt, that personality sold the show. And 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 I think when I got, they were looking for plug-and-play guys. And I think I got put into that. When I birthed Conqueror, 
We had good numbers because it was about this guy, Bert, who did roller coasters and didn't like roller coasters. Mm-hmm. And then when I started getting put into like trip flip, it was just more like a, let's let's water him down a little bit. Yeah. Take the edge off, make it more accessible for everyone. But in making it more accessible for everyone, you alienate the people who want to f- show up for that guy. So that's what happened to my pilot. The first cut was really funny. And we had these kind of zany ideas. And I did some more silly stuff on my show early on in the beginning. I'd pop out from behind stuff and have more like comedic lines or stand-ups prepared. Yeah. And... <clears throat> We did that. We did We did like a showdown. Like we're in Florida. We're trying three unique foods and there's going to be one winner. And Chef Ralph Pagano in in Florida, I forgot what city, um, Fort Lauderdale. Is that in Florida? Yeah. He, uh, I and I I watched, um, oh God, what was that show? Um, Norm for you. What's a comedy show with that really awkward guy who would help people's businesses? Nathan for you, yeah. Norm for you. <laughs> um, so I was so influenced by by Nathan for you. I just loved how like kind of cringy and awkward he was. So at the end, we made I it's my idea. They let me do so much stuff. Yeah. I had a big plaque that just said good job. And I said, I want to give you the most prestigious award ever been that's ever been given by a uh, food network. And I go, Can I get it, guys? Bring it in. And they brought it, and it just was a, a huge giant like foam check that said good job. And I gave it to him and I just awkwardly backed away and I was like, all right, so take care. And uh, he was like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> yeah. But I loved how it was just so really silly. And I know they didn't have anything like that. And I was like, I think this could work. I think it's funny and it's it's enough food, but just with a little bit extra on top. And in the end, they're like, so we think it's better to just focus on the food. We want it to be really food focused for the first time and let that be kind of in the front and well, then a little bit more of you in the back. And they just cut out like... I did an interview with a mermaid. I put on a mermaid tail and swam Boy, in the... I never thought I'd be in a room with someone else who was dressed as a mermaid. Oh, you did it too? Wiki Wachi. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's a in, tough job. Uh, it's insanely tough. Yeah. Insanely you, tough. And by the way, did you swim? You were in. You did this in Florida, right? Yeah. And you, it, Wiki Wachi is where it was at. Um. Yeah. yeah I, was, I can't remember the name of the place. There's, 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 I think there's more than one in Florida. There's no, gotta there's, be. Uh, there's one There's one mermaid in Florida. Place? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They are famous for it. Mm-hmm. Wiki Wachi, it's in, I want to say it's Tarpon Springs, but it's just above Tampa. Mm-hmm. And so you're, what they do is they go down fucking 40 feet and breathe through hoses. Oh. Did you do the, the mermaid theater? So there's a window for the people who are eating to go look in. And uh, it wasn't 40 feet down. It's probably 12 feet down. But the window is 12 feet. The window is 12 feet. But the girls go 40 feet down to the and do a whole mermaid show. Oh. I put on the tail. And did the window and had to dive down to the window and almost fucking drowned. Was it hard for them to find a tail your size? I was, by the way, because it was I'm hard. Certain for- I find, <laughs> I'm certain I, it's one of my least flattering pictures, and I know I have this because it was hard for me. They had to, um, they had to get zip ties to hold it onto my body. <laughs> Are you serious? Yes. Here, I, I can't believe. And they cut this out. They cut it out of the pilot. Yeah, yeah. Where's where is WikiWatchy? We pull up WikiWatchy on the map so I can find it. Because I think it's in, yep, here it is. Wikiwachi. John, oh, that's the guy's card. Let's see. Oh, I don't have the pictures of me and the mermaid tail. Um, Should I block this for the camera? No, don't. Yeah, Wikiwachi. See if you can just type, type in Burt Kreischer mermaid. Wikiwachi is fucking awesome, by the way. It's crystal blue. It's gorgeous. And it's old school Florida. That's old school tourism of Florida. Mm-hmm. They used to do big um, uh, ski boat shows. There you go. Oh, <laughs> that's very flattering. That's a nice yeah. fit. It's not, it's not that bad. No, no yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're a merman. God. A merman, yeah. That's very nice. Yeah. So what the hard part is you don't know. One of the girls, the girl I worked with, her name was Sativa. Uh-huh. And I was like. It's memorable. I go, that can't be your real name. She goes, ah, oh, no, I smoke a lot of weed. And I was like, <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> the holidays are just around the corner. If you're looking for a gift for a friend or family member, look no further. Skylight frames. I've bought no less than 15 skylight frames in my life for my, my mom, my dad, my sisters, my aunts, my our best friends, we bought them for all our friends because it's a great gift. What it is, is it's a, I think, 11-inch 
frame. It's a, it's a professional looking frame, but it's a screen. And what you do is you get that screen, you give it to someone, it takes 60 seconds to set up, and then you email pictures to that screen, and they pop up on the screen, and they flash through, and you can grab them with your finger and swipe and like and, and save and, and do all that stuff. And, it's, and it's, it looks like a real frame. But what's great is it's a great way to keep in touch. So we did it for our, my mom and my dad. Uh, over Christmas, and we preloaded all the pictures, and then we sent them, and then they plugged it in. All they had all great pictures, and then as we took awesome pictures, we then sent it to this email, and they'd pop up on their frame. And what's even better, and this is why I bought it for friends, is I can send pictures of myself to my friends' frames, and then when I go to their house, I see pictures of myself. <laughs> That's the best part. It's not the best part. It literally sets up in 60 seconds. And if you don't like it, they have a hundred percent satisfaction guaranteed. But you're going to love your skylight. But if you don't, They'll give you a full refund. Right now, as a special offer, you can get $10 off your purchase of a Skylight Frame when you go to skylightframe.com and enter the code BERT. That's right. Get $10 off your purchase of a Skylight Frame. Just go to skylightframe.com and enter the code BERT. That's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-F-R-A-M-E.com and the promo code's BERT. I know, I know, it feels like the year just started but can you believe it it's almost over and the holidays are right around the corners when's the last time you got a gift that you really wanted i always end up buying myself what i really wanted make this holiday the gift you give yourself that you've always wanted a better smile let me tell you something my friends at candid can help a great smile is a game changer it really is a game changer i i have literally perfectly aligned teeth are not the best color but and and i was gifted that at a young age by my parents and if you don't have it you can get it for yourself with candid you they only work with orthodontists who are expert in movement with candid the same orthodontists that create your plan can track your progress so you never have to wonder how you're doing you can book an appointment at a candid studio near you or you can do everything from the comfort and convenience of your own home your own home the candid treatment is just six months and you're going to start seeing results way before then. And this costs thousands less than traditional braces. And with your aligner treatment, you'll get a candid-free teeth whitening for free. God, I wish I had that. It doesn't work on my teeth because I have veneers. You're probably like, what, Bert? Tell me more about your teeth. Treat yourself to the gift you've always wanted, a straighter, brighter smile. Right now, you can get started from home for just $15 with a Candid starter kit. Or you can book an appointment at a Candid studio near you today. Go to candidco.com slash Bert and use the code Bert. That's candidco.com slash Bert and use the code Bert. Take advantage of this limited time offer for a $15 starter kit. That's candidco.com slash Bert and use the code Bert. What's great is that uh, the scripts had huge successes with DIY, HGTV, and uh, cooking and food and travel and great American country. And now they're, they've merged with Discovery. And so you got the OG travel channel people that were all travel channel before the scripts merger that went discovery that are all working hand in hand with the scripts people i think big things should come i i really look i'll be with i'll be having dinner with Dan, with uh, matt butler uh when i'm in dc november yeah. 3rd <clears throat> well here's the difference um you know all these people and I i've don't. known them for a long time and they're and they're all like i mean they're p- people i've spent a lot of time with so yeah i i know i know all of them i've i've been I knew my days were numbered when I I earnestly pitched. I, th- I want to say to Kathleen, I earnestly pitched a a DIY show called because their big brand was Kitchen Crashers, uh-huh. Bath Crashers, Yard Crashers, uh, di- Living Room Crashers, and I said, "How about Moat Crashers?" She goes, "What's that?" I said, "Every man's house is his castle. Every castle deserves a moat." I go, <laughs> "We go to to Home Depot and we find someone in the shovel area and we go, Are you guys building a moat." And you know, no one's going to be building a moat. You go, you want one? And you know, one asshole's like, I'll take a fucking moat. Uh, and then we build him a fully functioning moat around his house. This seems like at least five seasons. I go, but, but, for, yeah, but first of all, the numbers are through the roof on just, would you turn it off when you're like, holy shit, they're digging all around his house. Yeah. I, like I, everyone's going to watch it. And then she goes, I, I don't know if anyone will want a moat. And I remember being like, I want a moat. Like, you fucking kidding me? I'll take a moat. <laughs> and then they were like, okay. She's like, do you have another idea? And I was like, bathrooms, bathrooms, bathrooms. She's like, that's, what's that? I said, that's the name of the show. We go into every room into your house and we turn every room into a bathroom. And she was like, she's like, what? And I go, Kathleen, I was like, I think I was, I pitched it to Kathleen. I was like, 
I was like, listen, this, hear me out. I go, it may not be great for the homeowner, okay? <laughs> it, but it's great television. When you show up and you see the homeowner, I go, what the fuck happened to my house? Right. And he's like, what, what did you guys do to my living room? And I just show up and I go, you mean your bathroom? <laughs> and I go, and if you're in the business, we're putting a bathroom in the house. We're the show for you. We just put nine bathrooms in this house. And then she goes, okay, I don't, I don't see it. And I go, okay, last one called blind design we got a blind guy to design your house oh, oh and she was like i don't know. i go fourth third act fourth act guy walks in and he goes oh my god what the fuck happened here and he goes well see that guy talking to the refrigerator he designed your house bring him over and he's and but i i really thought those were sellable ideas i pitched a show to travel channel called uh, dentured adventures where i go into a uh, old home uh -huh. with old people and i go all right the day's yours. What do you guys want to do? And this woman's like, I've always wanted to ride a horse. And you're like, all right, yeah. we're riding horses. And you just live out everyone's bucket list adventures. Mm. And they're like, uh, they're like, I don't know. It's too, yeah, it's too different. I my, know. mine, yeah. even mine wasn't a big departure from a normal travel show. It was just a little bit more quirky. It was it's like just, 5% different. And they were still I, like, no. Can I tell you what, what I like about your show is that it is a nod to Bourdain. Yeah, like it really is. I found it to be a very big nod to Bourdain in that it is a traditional show, but it is your thumbprint on what a traditional show would look like. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it's not 22 minutes. It's whatever you th feel like it needs to be, right. which is great. So then talk to me. So so you get passed up by Travel Channel and you decide to double down, right? Well, so what's interesting is um, they go, yeah, it didn't get picked up, but they were they were like, let's do another pilot. Like Food yeah. Network's interested. We could do, they had some ideas, like, I don't know, cheap tacos or burgers. And I was just like. Well, but man, you, you, you missed, you missed a, a whole swath of success at Travel Channel. There's a guy, type in burger expert. There's a guy who did, I, I one was called the, called the Burger Show. Mm -hmm. Type in Travel Channel Burger. And it was so fucking good. And all he did was eat burgers mm -hmm. every, for fucking four acts. Burgers and burgers and burgers and they weren't that fucking different yeah they told me and they, they had a, a so show about tacos and i was like the whole show's about tacos burgerland what's the guy's name the host's name george, george what george what burgerland and man this guy was Mott. george motts dude he is fucking fascinating and he is obsessed with burgers mm -hmm. and i would watch this and i could watch you eat a burger four different ways and i never lost interest and he was a show. I think he did it on his own and put it on. And everyone was like, who's going to fucking watch just a show about burgers? And it was one of the highest rated shows yeah, on the network. But they did. Yeah. Tacos, pizza. They had one pizza show. Mm -hmm. Like right after this, they started going like, fuck it. Pick one lane. Right. Yeah. The taco one they said was doing really well. And I, I couldn't believe it. So they, they wanted to do it. The idea of doing another pilot at that time seemed exhausting because it, it takes a year. It just takes a whole year to do it. And I didn't even like what we came up with the first time so i said i think i'm good and by this time my channel's become lucrative and i've grown so, so then my, so where are you group. where are you at where are you at on this channel at this time <clears throat> like subscribers um, if you remember but between 100 and 200 000. okay so like the flywheel is turning we've got traction i've got a decent little office and uh the team is growing I'm like why would i leave this why would i leave all this to go do that again i'm like i just have to double down on what i'm doing here so i was in vietnam that's the thing i was, I was saying about burning the boats is for the longest time, I was making videos, one to two videos a week. And I'm a year, year and a half in, and videos are getting like 2,000 views. And I was like, what the fuck am I doing? Yeah. Like, this isn't working. People don't get it. I think it's like funny or interesting. I'm trying to do something different, but people aren't connecting with it at all. And I had my buddy, Andrew, uh, from Australia. And he would just, we would lift weights together in this gym that costs like a nickel every time you go. And he would just be like, yeah, what are you going to do? Just keep going. Yeah. And that was like his motivational speech. Like, oh, what the fuck are you going to do? And so I was like, I'm already here. Just keep going. Just keep going. Just keep, keep going. going. And then it just slowly started to pick up speed and pick up traction. And then we had add more team members. I mean, now we have 15 team members that make up the whole show. And we have, you know, researchers, producers, um, post-production, um, mastering, shooters. Most of them, uh, my team is largely, largely Vietnamese, but they're fucking excellent. World-class, like, Excellent team. The show doesn't happen without the team. Yeah. They're incredible. So I just want to make sure I say that. Um, but from there, I just doubled down on the show and focused 100% on the show. So you're taking any any ad sales revenue and putting it back into the show? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And just it's all about growing and growing. And we were growing quick. I mean, 
we in the time it took to get to a hundred thousand, we got to a million even faster than that. And so we're we were growing like two to three million per year. And um it's been staying around maybe two million a year now. And it's it's been tough. This last year's been crazy. We could maybe talk about that later, but um yeah, as the channel grew, it just kept doing getting better. And I tried to improve the quality and obviously I got better as a host with more experience. And um I'm I'm very happy with where it's at now. It's funny because right before the pandemic happened, we got to a point where I was like, this is what I want the show to be. We'd just gone to Lagos in Nigeria, city mm -hmm. of 20 million people. Oh, I saw that with uh, the 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 Miss Nigerian. Yeah, Miss yep, yeah, Miss Miss uh Miss World Africa. Miss, God damn Miss it, Nigeria. She's fucking beautiful. She was I couldn't believe we got that. She had this viral moment because she got second place but was celebrating for the person so excited who excited for the first person. place. Yeah. And I was like, let's try to reach out and contact her. And she was down and she made it happen. And we flew her out. This is one of the hardest shoots we ever did. It's one of the most expensive. Um, we went to Namib Namibia and Nigeria. Two weeks. The whole thing costs like over $50,000. Wow. And uh, I mean, you have to pay local fixers there a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. That's what I, when I was watching that, I was like, there was, I think, I think I, I wonder if it was that, but it was like, there was almost like a, there was not beef with locals but they were just acting disrespectful to you or something um well so going there we had to uh yeah it's a tough place to shoot and luckily i'd gotten I've a little shot warmed, in africa i've got a little warmed up in kenya and that got me ready for nigeria but yeah we had two fully armed security at all times and they've got they've got guns and combat gear and everything and we needed them is the scary part and so there was a couple uh incidents um one was we went to makoko makoko is this giant floating village or it's more of a slum. Did I see this on, was, was Makoko on one of a Bourdain's things? Yeah. He, okay. he'd also yeah. gone to Makoko yeah, and yeah, I was yeah. like, Oh, that place is like so, so unique. We have to go there. Yeah. And, um, I think we told a pretty different story. I don't know for sure. We're both traveling. We're going to overlap yeah. places and destinations a lot, but, um, we went there and we, we shot with the chief's son. And as we left, there's a guy, kind of like posturing because you have to to get to that slum you have to snake through a, about half a mile of little tiny narrow alleyways the kind of alleyways where like if you reach both arms out you can touch both buildings and if you look inside the doorways you're looking into people's lives you see yeah. their houses you see them cooking like you see their day-to-day -day life which as an american it's like oh i'm not supposed to be seeing that like i'm not supposed to be seeing what you're doing right now you're putting mm -hmm. on a shirt or whatever and uh we're walking through this guy starts posturing this dude big broad thick wide shoulders deep voice people people in nigeria have like a kind of a voice that hits you in your chest like a sonic boom it's, like it's it goes best. through you it's that best uh i i knew i, I did an episode of a tv show with christian okoya mm. the nigerian nightmare mm -hmm. and and i said to him as a joke we were all taking pictures everyone's taking pictures and then i go oh wait 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 can i just get just one of me and him with our shirts off and everyone like froze and then everyone started laughing and he goes but i don't get it and i was like oh, i'm just making a joke i was like just me thinking this was like 20 years ago uh -huh. so everyone leaves and the set and it's just me and him kind of getting ready to leave and he grabs me hard by the arm and he goes hey take your shirt off and i went what and he goes now take your shirt off and i went uh, okay and he goes i got you funny guy <laughs> and i was like motherfucker <laughs> yeah it's a my buddy Godfrey, uh, Godfrey Danshima is is his full name, but he's Nigerian. I think he's Nigerian, and uh, and he he does a great, but it's a booming voice. Yeah. So imagine that guy, but his anger is at a ten, and he's jumping around you, uh, jumping around you, and threatening you. So that that's what was happening. So yeah. like, I push my camera guys and my producer to the middle. I grab their cameras so they don't have to worry about holding on. I don't know. In these moments, you're like, okay, what can I do? Yeah. Especially as the leader of this team who I don't want it to be like two hours from now. You're like, wow, our boss puts us in some fucked up situations. And so I grab their cameras, maybe at least one of them. <laughs> and uh, and then I'm just keeping an eye on our security because they're smiling. So I'm like, okay, they're smiling. Then I think this is probably fine. We just keep moving because yeah. he wouldn't touch anybody. He would do everything but. And with his energy, you'd think like a punch is landing soon. Um, and so we got, we, you know, snaked through the alley. We jumped into our van. We took off. But it was terrifying. Dude, those terrifying moments on a travel show. Because you think if you're on a travel show, you're fine. But you don't realize you're walking in with what sometimes you'll be in a place where it's under underprivileged or well, not underprivileged, uh, uh, more, more poverty poor. stricken. It's poor. It's just poor. And you're walking in with 
what looks like a treasure trove of, oh, yeah. of, of, of goods. Right. And I remember we were at a place called the Blue... No, we were in a place... Uh, it's not the Blue Irie Hole. We were in Jamaica at a place where there was this bath that if you got in, it would cure all your ailments, mm -hmm. right? And we went up to this place and uh, we paid off one guy to be the expert. And there were bigger guys there that now wanted to be the expert. Mm -hmm. So they wanted the job. And they, they didn't know what was happening, but they found it out and they beat the guy that was originally supposed to be our expert with a rock. <laughs> and then Holy they shit. said they would be the experts and then they would be bathing us. Oh. <laughs> Talk about scary. Oh. Three fucking, three Americans in what is arguably a fucking puddle and just <laughs> oh, four Jamaicans just bathing them. <laughs> like, Can we leave now? Can we leave? Okay. This is so fucking scary. I'm healed. I'm healed. See if you can okay. find the Trip Flip Jamaica episode and find the name of the place we went. I remember one guy called the they one guy called the guy a boomba clot and the guy took a rock and hit him in the head and uh -huh. we were like, Okay, I think that guy got hit in the head with a rock and we're like and it was just so fucking god damn it. I'm the couple that we brought with us were just like, All right. We're done now. That guy's from Austin, by the way. He's a comic. Wait, this is Triplet. You had a couple with you? I had a couple with me. Trip oh, flip. no. Trip Flip. <laughs> oh, the guy's God. name's Nate. He's a comic. He's from Austin. Uh, Trip Flip, Jamaica. Meanwhile, people were afraid of going to Vietnam. Yeah. It was, <laughs> man, that was a fucking... I would really love someone to do a uh, a full website. If, if anyone's looking for some promotion of whatever, you can advertise on this website. But if you would do a full website of all the trip flip episodes and the things we did, I would love to find that because I have so many stories about this and they all mm. blend into one. Right. And I often misquote because my memory is shit. I often misrepresent what we did yeah, and in different places. When you're traveling and the jet lag, it all just blurs together, right? Uh, it all... Pictures. Go to pictures, Jamaica. Okay. It doesn't look like Jamaica. Oh my God, we went horseback riding in the ocean. I bet the fucking bath didn't get put on the episode it was terrifying yeah and those you get those moments where we had we were stopped by some sort of uh i, I wouldn't know i was pla i was blackout drunk but in in tanzania mm -hmm. we were stopped by some officials that wanted to wanted money and wanted to shake us down and i was out i was passed out and then i woke up and everyone was terrified it was like hey do we still have beer in here and everyone's like the fuck have you been <laughs> And I was like, I just slept through the whole thing. Oh no! I slept through all of it, and yeah. then and then we were in when we were in Tanzania. Someone's elephant got stolen by a tribe, and this white dude had these two elephants, and a tribe stole one of the elephants. And they're like, and then another tribe came in, and they're like, we're gonna steal the elephant back. And I was like, oh shit! I was like, I want to go get an elephant, and they're like, mm, yeah, it's not for you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it, that sounds like quite that. That's some good BTS. See, if you had a GoPro, you could just vlog that saving elephant god man and then by the way the white dude was gorgeous on that tanzania trip he's the one whose elephant got stolen oh he was a white dude and his dad i don't know i think they had like a place a refuge for elephants who fucking knows my memory is so bad that even like in telling that story i get halfway through and i'm like was the was he even good looking <laughs> like i remember him to be beautiful i remember this guy was like really good looking like ripped blonde hair uh -huh. it's amazing how your memory changes on you yeah oh yeah or like slides things and especially when you've traveled as much as you have because you've traveled how many episodes have you done like 400 that's like it's a lot that's a fucking ton all all in asia no 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 no. so we've been oh, yeah you to, did africa we've been to kenya madagascar namibia nigeria oman um iran i went to iran Ooh. yeah i've got stories about iran um a lot of asia we did We've done some stuff in the South in the U.S. And then where else do we go? I think that's about it. Iran's um, a lot like uh, Twitter. <laughs> this is a, get ready for this joke to bomb. Iran's a lot like Twitter. You go there and everyone's nice as shit, but it just takes one troll to fucking cut your head off. And you're oh, like, oh, yeah. I don't so you've been to Iran? No, I'm just guessing. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's like that. Well, so what I wanted to say, just finishing wrapping up what I was saying about Nigeria is, is we had really gotten, like, I, I, I loved that we were going somewhere that no other food vloggers online go to like, yeah uh, we're going to somewhere that's very difficult and even bourdain and zimmern couldn't go everywhere they wanted because they can't get insurance for every country that's, and if you can't get production big... insurance you're not going to go there you know that's why he went to cnn right right because he could do a lot more because they were a news organization so their journalists have 
different insurance policies so he could get into anywhere he wanted to. Yeah. And, and so, so we wrapped up. It was super hard, but super rewarding. And the episodes were incredible. I mean, we went to a, a wild game market where they had like all the stuff they talk about that started the pandemic, which, which didn't actually, but like the pangolins and all the animals there. Really? Um, at the market on these tables, like everything was so wild and vivid and, and um, talking to the people of Makoko and the struggles they go through in that village. And I think I saw you put up like a disclaimer in that video, right? Uh, yeah. Where, where you were like, where you, I think you were going in and going like, oh, like some of the things they were trying to sell you, you're like, oh, I don't feel comfortable with that. Yeah, that's a tough one to figure out. Like, what is okay to say? What should we not say? Um, I don't want the whole video to be like a, a cliche vice documentary where they just play dark music and they're like, here in the market, they're selling endangered animals. And what you never hear, uh, this is going to be unpopular opinion, but you hear. Who, By the way, I almost named my special that. Unpopular opinion. Upon your unpopular opinions. We we went there. When you're in Africa, you uh, or when you hear about Africa, who are you hearing opinions from? Local African people? No. no. You're hearing about like a... Uh, biologists or people who study animals going there and then you hear their opinion yeah. and that's it so we only hear one side and believe it or not that is a side that is not always the objective truth and if you're somebody who likes animals you're probably going to be on the side of let's kill less of these because i really like them so that's not to say that there aren't endangered animals and there's not issues out there but when you talk to local villagers this is the first time i got the other side which is i'm asking kind of the obvious questions are you are there less animals now than there used to be? Are, are these hard to hunt? Um, like from the time you were a kid till now, are you, are you seeing less here? And they're like, no, what are you talking about? Absolutely not. Like the jungle is full of animals. And and so to them, at least the stuff we, were, we had there, they yeah. said there's, there's tons of it. It's not a big deal. It's, I'm it's, not saying that's correct or incorrect. So it's just interesting that it's a different point of view. And it's, a, it's yeah. Well, I think everyone's, everyone's going to represent what they, everyone's going to represent what they want you to, what they want to shift you to right so like if i if you ask me about our comedy club safe to go to right now I'd yeah be like, fuck yeah they're yeah, fine absolutely. yeah they're fine and people wear masks and if you're eating or drinking <clears throat> take it off and then and then or and then you know like that's what i'd say that i was at the improv everyone wore masks unless they were eating or drinking and it was fucking great it was a mm -hmm. great show and by the way it's dark in the back i can't see anyone in the back anyway people distance themselves they don't sell all the seats but if you're you know, someone who wants you to believe in the other side of it. You right. know, the, these are fucking, this is terribly safe. Super spreader safe. events. Or, or even, or even like, I, like one of my good friends, I saw one of his clips today online and he was, uh, he was mocking, like he, he took it a little too far in my opinion and was mocking people who are worried about, you know, the virus. And I was like, well, I wouldn't mock them. Mm -hmm. I was like, we're all fucking concerned. At even you are concerned a tad bit, mm -hmm. but it's a comic and he's just representing, you know, and so you go, fuck it. Who gives a shit? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know, but so it's hard. It's hard in those situations to figure out the line. And usually the best place to be is just on the side of the people who the story is about. So this is this is yeah. what they think. And this is a reflection of what I've learned from them. And it was really interesting because at the end of the episode where we went to one of those um, game markets, I was we were eating a giant lizard, like uh, some kind of Komodo dragon type thing or monitor, giant monitor. And while we're eating it, I'm like, you know, I was in Kenya they ate a kidney raw from a goat and they're like, oh, nasty. <laughs> and I'm like, really? So so that's the line for you guys? They're like, yeah, yeah that's not cool. Oh, I ate, I ate, uh, we went to a restaurant this weekend, this weekend, and they served, um, it was grouper maybe, but it had the fish head. My, our, be my, our best friends are Vietnamese and my friend Sandy was like, fish head's the best part. Mm. It's all the cartilages in there. It's rich. Yeah, so me cheeks. and her ate the cheeks, ate the fish head, and ate the eyes. Mm -hmm. And my wife's like, you're eating the eyes? I actually thought it was like calamari because it's, you know, you get the eye socket. Yeah. And then I was like, I'm eating the fucking eyes. And Sandy's like, oh, I'm not eating the eyes. And I was like, I'm the only one eating the eyes. And I was like, am I going to get sick? And, but I didn't. <laughs> I had a great time. I mean, they wouldn't put yeah. the eyes in there if you couldn't eat them. Right. Yeah. And that's there's a lot of misconceptions about street food because people assume, dude, I ate a corn dog at Red Rocks or something. And, and I had... I had Armageddon level <laughs> diarrhea for like three days <laughs> from whatever I ate at Red Rocks. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. And but meanwhile, I've eaten raw goat's blood in uh, in Kenya, no problem. Raw kidney, no problem. Yeah, raw. raw in in Japan, I had raw chicken, raw horse, raw beef. Um, I've had street food from everywhere. So I think 
people are far too paranoid about street food and it making them sick. I probably do have somewhat of a good constitution, but I think that's the other thing. I got I got a pretty thick constitution after mm -hmm. Travel Channel. Yeah, I ate I ate oysters in per, per Puerto Rico out of a cooler that wasn't technically that cold. <laughs> and I remember the guy was and you know he squirts the juice onto the oyster for you out of like a shampoo bottle, and you just like. <laughs> And yeah. you're just like, I yeah, love oysters. Yeah. And we ate it. I didn't have, didn't get sick. I, they were really good. And you're like, and the guy's like, I just got them. At, he's like, you're look. I remember them saying, the guy was like, you're looking at present tape. This isn't his exact words. It was in Spanish. Our translator was translating. And I speak a little, enough Spanish to understand. The guy wasn't pissed. But he was like, I just, we were right by the ocean. And he goes, I just swam in that ocean and got these oysters. So that's why they're not cold. Mm. And they're in this cooler because this is what I have, and this is the best sauce for them. Mm. And he's looking at me like, I just got him out of there, motherfucker. Like that. Right. But he was he wasn't mad, but it was it was because we're used to seeing him on a platter full of ice, right? With two cups of things. And the guy's like, No, no, no. They come out of there, by the way. Meanwhile, they're flown in from some other place, like a place that's not even nearby. Yeah. But we're like, this is the presentation I'm comfortable with. It's a lot of times it's it's come presentation. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I, have you ever had? I'm <clears throat> I'm sure you have. But one of the, my favorite things ever is you go fishing, you catch a tuna, mm. they pull it up, and they just start cutting it up for you on the boat. And yeah. you're like, oh. Yeah, it's awesome. Especially if they have some soy sauce on the boat, a little wasabi. That's great. Dude, we did it. We did it in Costa Rica one time. I, I forgot what we caught, but the guy cut it up and on the boat, cut it up and made a ceviche. Mm -hmm. And I fucking could not. And by the way, not the cleanest hands not the fucking and you were fine yeah cuts it on the fucking seat of the boat with a knife that maybe he dunked in the ocean mm -hmm. and, I, and i ate the whole fucking thing it was yeah. one of the best things i've ever had <laughs> in my entire life i, I want to go back to what you were talking about in uh in the open tabs uh podcast where you're talking about travel channel and you were talking about me burning bridges and um <laughs> for me i never felt like that's what i was doing uh because uh so i Going back to it, like, I, I didn't, uh, they wanted to do another pilot. I, I didn't want to. And then meanwhile, like, what was really kicking it or killing there was, uh, you know, haunted shows and ghost yeah, shows. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I mocked the fact that they're all fake because they're obviously fake. At least I don't believe in ghosts. So, yeah, I know it's like <laughs> season nine, episode three. All right, we haven't found a ghost yet, but today's the day. And um, it's, I don't know. My joke. I what used am to I going to say? That's for smart people. No, it is for dumb people. No, but it's it's but it's entertainment. It's, it's entertainment. It's entertainment. And, and by the way, I I guarantee you, if Zach takes you to his house in Vegas and locks you in the basement, you'll believe in ghosts pretty quickly. Sure. And I don't know. Yeah. Zach, and, and by the way, Zach Zach has. I think he owns the the Tate Aria or the who not Tate uh, who the, the Manson people killed the other family that was like the in los mm. Feliz, he owns that house mm. he owns he's like hardcore into the occult like like oh like a hardcore in the occult and the shoes those shows do so well but they i mean i don't think i can really honestly tell you zach does not believe they're fake I, zach or mm. aaron do not believe they're fake they have cool. they have like i remember when we went to um to uh, not Ellis Island. Where's the place? Alcatraz. Mm. I, t I texted Zach and I was like, "Hey man, I want to scare the fuck out of myself tonight." And he was like, "Here's what you do." And he texted me like a list of what they do. Mm. And I got I got off by myself. I got lost. Right, genuinely lost. So you all of a sudden your heart's racing. Mm -hmm. I went into solitary confinement and I shut the door and I sat in there and uh, I, I, all of a sudden I get chill bumps and I start going, "Oh fuck! Oh shit! Something's in here with me." And now I'm like, oh my god, something's in here is gonna hit me. Like I feel like I'm gonna get hit. And uh, and then I saw this red light, and I was like, what the fuck? And I was like, someone's in here. They're videotaping me, and I kicked it open. No one's in there. And I was like, shit. And I mean, I think you. Can, I mean, I I think certain types of people are more prone to getting those experiences, and certain people aren't. And I think that that's. Is it, is it smart people? It might be. I. I definitely am not that intelligent, and I get <laughs> haunted all the time. We have a ghost that lives in our house named Max. And uh, and a cobra. She thought it's a cockroach. Oh, I thought she said it was a cobra, and I was like, definitely not a cobra. <laughs> We're not in Vietnam anymore, babe. But no, but uh, 
I just find, I just think it's in those situations. In I've done it so much. Mm. We talk shit about someone, and then all of a sudden, they someone hits you up and like, "Hey, man, bleep this name out." Hey, man, <laughs> wants to take a meeting with you, and you're like, "Oh God, ah, uh, is it? Did he know what I said? <laughs> right. or, or is it? He's a fan? Oh yeah. fuck!" And then you're like. Hey man, huge fan, and you're waiting for the shoe to drop. Him going, oh, I'm gonna watch more of your stuff, and you're like, please don't, oh, yeah, don't, don't Google don't me, do don't Google my name and your name together. That would be a really bad idea, <laughs> right? And so I always, I always take that road of like, you never know if you get like, you never, you never know what could happen. Well, with, that's with smart. And there. you live, you live in, and LA. I live in LA. It makes sense. Um, and I don't even know this that guy. I'm sure he's a great guy. He's a great guy, and I'm sure he's made an entertain like he's still making entertainment nonetheless. Obviously, I'm being yeah. very cynical about it. I didn't feel like I was burning any bridges because I mean I, I'm still in touch with High Noon. They're still trying yeah. to pitch me to streaming platforms and see if something oh, I don't will come you, out of it one day. Yeah. And um, otherwise, what I don't think I mean it's, I had the chance to still work with Food Network and Travel Channel. I said no. No, I think I think your I think your take also is. I'm a very Hollywood centric guy. So like, I'm always like, Hey, you never know who you're going to run into in traffic or at a Lakers game or at a Rams game. Or, right. And, and you always want those, those meetings to be like positive and like, Oh shit. It's so good to see you. Oh, thank you. I'm such a huge fan. And I know I can tell you right now, my friends that all moved to Austin have no problem shedding all of that shit. And they're like, no, I'm done. Mm. Like fucking the people at dot 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 are fucking idiots and they ran that into the fucking ground and here's the mm. thing and you go oh that would be fucking so exhilarating to not need people in this business yeah but i that is not my like i'm i'm in this fucking we shock the dicks i suck in the city <laughs> <laughs> well but what's great is you're you're kind of in both worlds right so a little bit yeah you had the insight to do your own thing here, build your own audience and have control over your audience and what they're seeing and the content and go, just go directly to them. But you're still working, you're still doing TV and you're doing well, stuff like that. So. I'll tell you what, it's the same thing I, we were saying, we were saying that I was guilty, I've been guilty of, is this big dicks, big, big, big time suck my dick attitude. When podcast popped off and, yeah. and I realized I didn't financially need Travel Channel or, I, and I realized how big my reach was on this podcast or my other podcasts or my buddy's podcast that I go on. I, I remember like, they'd be like, Hey, do you want to do a uh, fucking dot, dot, dot show? And mm. I'd be like, no. And they're like, hold on. And I was like, no, I'm, I don't, I don't fucking, I'm not a fan of that. And I don't want to do it because mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not going to enjoy it. And they're like, well, what about this show? And you're like, no. And, and, and in times like that, I, sh I believe I should have taken those opportunities, hmm. created relationships with certain people who are still having big shows. Sure. But, I, but just as just as big as the podcast, just as big as the outreach I have, but you can cross pollinate and all of a sudden get a bigger. It's like, but it was also, I don't know, this is going to sound fucking cunty, but it was like, you'd hire a publicist and they'd be like, great, we got you this, 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 and this. But can you get on Rogan? And you'd be like, did you, did I just hire you so you could? Right. Tell me I need to call my friend and get on his show. Right. And then, because Rogan's the biggest name in media. Mm -hmm. Right now, he's, and for a long time, he's been the biggest name in media. Right. And, and but he's he's also my friend, so it's a very hard to leverage. It's like being friends with Johnny Carson. It's like, yeah, you, you don't want to, you want to have a friendship mm -hmm. that's first. You don't want every time you see the guy to just be doing his podcast. Right. You want to be able to spend time with him and hang out with him. And so that when you do do a podcast, you're not just a, a, a fucking fan a, a relationship based off this one podcast mm -hmm. um so i yeah i was i was guilty of it when the podcast started popping and now i i kind of i still do radio tours i still respect all my radio relationships like i almost cherish them because i feel like i was this lucky generation to go around do radio and then be able to do radio and then do podcasting and then still can kind of foster these relationships i had a great relationship up until you know he left with conan I saw Andy Richter yesterday playing golf. Hmm. Like, and Conan was a great show because you always want to do it. I had a great relationship with David Letterman. Mm -hmm. I did his show. Um, and he's been very, very kind to the way he spoke about me. And I and I just kind of was like, I don't know, you know, like Yeah. No, I think that's smart. Yeah. Uh, and as long as you don't feel like you uh you're being disingenuous oh. because uh there's stuff, but you don't seem like someone who let, like your main mode is to talk shit and oh, that's your your thing. It's not let the machine movie do 400 million dollars and everyone can suck my dick <laughs> i will fucking walk around this town yeah with it out of my pants going suck it no i'm kidding or, or <laughs> just wait till you get canceled 
uh, or that. And then you have this to fall back on. Or 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 not. <laughs> or not. <laughs> we'll see. Maybe I'll just fucking but I'll come back to try. See, that's when I'll come back to Travel Channel and be like, so I've rebranded myself. Right. <laughs> apparently i don't do, talk recklessly anymore we can do a show about bathrooms and moats yeah guys how about the show called bert kreischer sucks his dick again i think that's a jim norton joke by the way um yeah i it, it there's a there's a real freedom in where you're at this episode of the bert cast is brought to you by zingaroo is your trading life spread across multiple apps imagine being able to make real money trades and see how you stack up against others i always do better I always do better with a little friendly competition. I always, weight loss, you name it. With Zingaroo, you can invite friends to a trading competition like never before. Oh my God, without even reading anything else, I can tell you this. If I was in competition with my friends, that would inspire me to work harder, do more research, do all the shit to beat them. Because that's what, fuck, that's the beauty of competition. And when you get, when you're talking about stocks, Instead of looking at the whole big picture, you look at the small picture of you and your friends. Invest in stocks, EFTs, and options, and manage your full trading portfolio. Join zones and compete and interact with traders. Track your performance on a live leaderboard. Zingaroo also offers bullpens, which provide you the opportunity to chat with friends and manage your individual portfolios. Create private areas that only you and your friends can access in order to chat, compete. Look, whether you're starting out in the market or a regular trader, Zingaroo is the way to learn more about trading in a fun, social, interactive way. This is a genius fucking app. This is a genius fucking app. Earn your bragging rights with Zingaroo by going to apps.zingaroo.com slash birdcast. I'm downloading this now, and I'm creating on my tour bus a Zingaroo portfolio. I'm telling you, this is genius. All investments involve risk and the past performance of a security or a financial product does not guarantee future results or returns. Securities offered by Z Squared Securities LLC member FINRA slash SIPC. This is not an offer, solicitation of an offer, or advice to buy or sell securities, or open a brokerage account in any jurisdiction where Z Squared is not registered. For additional details and explanations regarding Z Squared's social trading features, visit zingaroo.com slash f-a-q so that's a-p-p-s dot z-i-n-g-e-r-o-o dot com slash birdcast people are always like oh man i wish you had a netflix show but i'm already i'm already doing what i want um yeah. if it happened great i mean i wouldn't necessarily say no again i'd want to try to direct it and, and be a little bit in more control well, here's what happened here's what will happen okay uh, yeah I, and i've been in, i've been in this situation you know ultimately the best if you want, I always believe if you want to work with someone like Netflix or food or cooking or or travel, it's better to come to them mm -hmm. with a raw original idea and go. I have this great thing online that I want to keep. Yeah, but here's the other thing I can do that I'm, I'd be interested in doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Maybe not trying to just recreate my show with yeah. better cameras or something like that because that's all. Because in essence, and they also see that you know the potential in it because they've watched it and they do know what they're doing somewhat for the most part anyone who's working at netflix knows what they're doing most I, I, anyone that's working at food cooking all they know what they're doing they got their jobs for a reason so that they just want to put their thumbprint on it i always think it's better going with a brand new idea something a little raw that can be malleable and you're cool with people getting their insights because dude the second you relinquish all your control and you let other people do their jobs too mm -hmm. it's fucking i mean that's like it's like the best <clears throat> ever yeah but um but I, that's what i would do would you be interested in doing something on Netflix? Uh, yeah. I mean, if it was right, I mean, if they if the if they paid enough, where it wouldn't they, they, they affect, definitely, they definitely pay enough. Where, where it wouldn't affect kind of like my team because I wouldn't I wouldn't want to lay anybody off from my team or anything like that. And if it if they gave me just enough kind of say in what was happening to kind of shape the idea, but if it if they're just like, okay, hey, there's the food, here's the camera, there's the light, and then go be entertaining, do your thing. I, that's not really what I'm good at. Yeah, yeah I, th I think I'm a much better director than I am a host, and I just know how to put so myself in situations where, like, oh, that, I know I have a lot of questions about that, so I'll put myself in that situation, um, and that that's much more my strength. So then, how about this? Ready? Mm -hmm. What if Netflix came to you and said, "We want your idea. We want an idea for you. Mm -hmm. We met. We, we want an idea for you. We want you to direct. We want you to produce. But we want to. We want to find a new host who, and it's got to be a female. 
Ah. What I, celebrity female would you go, I would fucking really know how to work with her? Oh, I don't, I'm so out of this world. Mine's Charlize Theron. Who? I oh, think she's so amazing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, Jennifer Garner. Oh, you're Jennifer Garner. This. Have you Je thought about this before? Yeah, I, I, whenever I watch anyone on Instagram, I decide, could I... Could I direct, could, how would they do in the fucking shit I do? Right. Jennifer Gardner is a natural fucking talent. Mm -hmm. She is a natural goddamn talent who drinks up the camera. The camera loves her. And she is, she, have you ever watched her Instagram? No. Dude, her Instagram's fucking amazing. She pretty much does a show on her Instagram in her kitchen. She'll make sunflowers. She's like very sweet, right? Amazing. Yeah. She's great. Maybe, I think I have seen some clips. She's it, the she greatest. She just seems like the, the, like the ideal mom or something like that reese she's, witherspoon. she's at home oh yeah that'd be oh, reese witherspoon would be fucking the, the weirdest thing about some of these networks is they think like okay we have a travel show it's about food we need a chef and and people confuse uh my occupation people think i'm a chef yeah constantly i think because of that that archetype i'm like i'm not a chef yeah i'm, I'm a filmmaker I, like i would say that at most but I'm, I'm not a chef and i just try to find the stories and then when i talk to chefs uh, i would much rather watch a show where I don't hear just two chefs doing inside talk. Oh yeah, okay, so you do that, and then you make the boulognese sauce. Okay, I would rather have someone like me who's like, "What does that mean? What you're saying right now?" Because I don't know, and so probably a lot of people in my audience don't know. Yeah, but yeah, on Travel Channel, on on well, just a, a lot of travel type shows are like, "Well, we gotta have a chef," and that's difficult because someone who's a chef is not necessarily the most entertaining person. And there was yeah. kind of this gold struck with Bourdain because. He had the chef background. Um, he was good enough on camera. And then he was an incredible writer. And he really Amazing. leveraged that strength of his as a writer. If you go look at, I mean, his strength wasn't uh, as a performer on camera. Not that he was bad at that, but he was even better at writing. So the show was like this incredible writing with little clips of the best parts of his interactions with people. Yeah, And of course he got better and better over time. And I, yeah, I'm not saying at all that he was not a good performer on camera. But, no, he was. Yeah, he was, yeah. but it, but it, he was so good at writing that um, that that he could use that to tell stories in a in an incredible way where nobody else could. That was his strength. Was his 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 vo in those shows was 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 fucking prose. But if anyone does a travel show now, I'm I'm calling it for the next five years. You won't see a single travel show where there's voiceover because people are too afraid to be. Uh, criticized and they're afraid of being um, called a Bourdain knockoff. Yeah. And for some reason, voiceover has been used since forever. And oh, yeah. I, I love voiceover. And to me, it makes the show really dynamic. It makes it move quick. It's snappy. You kind of volley between what's really happening there and the voiceover. And it just moves the story along really well. But there hasn't been um, for years, there hasn't been a Netflix show that has voiceover in it. And because that is just understood, like that's the Bourdain thing. If you do that, you're copying Bourdain. Then and that's what I'll do. And that's not going to go away for a while. Oh, that's what I'm leaning into. We're doing, we're shooting content for this tour. And, uh, and I said, I, one of them, I said, I really want to do my Bourdain at somewhere that's just so cheesy. Mm -hmm. Like my, what is I'm into. Sure. And do like just me write the voiceover. But uh, I don't fucking know. We, 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 you know, we, we shot, we shot all this summer and we just never got, we edited some and, it just seemed too bloggy. It wasn't what I was into. Mm. It seemed a little too much like a, a like a fluff piece. Yeah. And then, and there's still, but there's still some cool shit I want to do on the road because that's what we do is we go out, tour, have fun during the day, try to shoot something and then cut it together. I just don't know how I'm going to do it. I used to love long reads. I used to love a long info read. Mm -hmm. uh, my name's Burke Kreischer. I'm here in Cedar Rapids at the Fearsome Foursome Challenge. Where I've got to ride this, and I used to love a good long. I loved them. Yeah, and uh, Adam Richmond was the best at those. Mm -hmm. Bourdain was not great at long. He didn't do long reads. I don't think he did it at, at all. I think he'd no. go, he'd go, all right, and then he'd go the the beautiful fucking vo would carry through. Yeah, out. exactly. Yeah, he hated that idea of of doing something that seemed set up like that. Oh, I loved it. I yeah. loved it when they first told it to me. I loved the energy of it because so we do. We did uh, the first episode we did was in Cedar Rapids at 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 Cedar Rapids. No, it's not Cedar Rapids. I'm going to Cedar Rapids, Cedar Point. Mm -hmm. We're going. Uh, we were in Cedar Point, and we they had the whole fucking everyone that was going into the theme park waiting at the gates, and we were chanting, "Open these gates, open these gates!" And then they're like, and then they're like, "Bert, you're gonna do your read, and when you're done your read, they open the gates, 
And I had like a thousand people behind me going, get it right, motherfucker. Yeah. I used to love, I used to love reads. Maybe, yeah, the, I'll, maybe I'll start doing reads for my thing. Um, so what I find is if, it, if it's feeling too vloggy, maybe it's just like too much entertainment with not enough I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what I'd like, if yeah. possible. Uh -huh. I would love for you to watch one of my vlogs. Oh, yeah. And do, but do, a, do a reaction video and going, all right. I'm here to critique Burt Kreischer's vlog. Sure. We're friends. So this is all meant to help him become a better filmmaker. And then, and, and just, and I'll, I'll repost it and everyone can comment. And I'll read the comments and, and, but I would love to see your take on one of my vlogs. Are they all online right now? They're all online. But I, I had, I have two different types. I used to do vlogs by myself, mm -hmm. which I had to end because I found out I was camera. I was cannibalizing my personal life. Yeah. So it was like just having a camera on me all the time, which I, and also Instagram stories showed up and it was like easier to do it on sure. that. Um, but we have these travel vlogs that we do for the bus. I wonder if I'll, uh, maybe I'll send you the first one we do. We're shooting the first one tomorrow. Shooting the first one tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, so it's not out yet. No, we, we, we well, I just got a new team. Exclusive. Yeah. So we're shooting the first one tomorrow. We're shooting one at, in Augusta, Georgia at RecTech. Mm -hmm. And then I think we're in Charleston, West Virginia at a swimming hole uh that i that i totally stole from this kid that i saw online he was like it's just a beautiful swimming hole sure and it just looks so cool and i was like i want to go there yeah and, which is part of what travel is and i'll trust me i'll own the fucking kid's name and tell him give him a shout out but uh and then i think we're in charlotte north carolina oh no charleston we're going for a hike to a rock outcrop charlotte we're doing the swimming hole and then atlanta we're just partying we have two shows and then we get on a we go to austin we'll shoot something there do two episodes of two bears one cave fly back out on the road and we'll do we're, we're trying to plan like two events a week sure and to release two episodes a week to promote future tour dates okay and does everything i mean how do you pay for all this stuff i'm trying i was trying to think of a better way to ask that no, question no, no, i but, just uh i just i i just kind of write it into a do you tour just kind of roll everything back into what you're trying to build here yeah i i, I look at it this way i i uh, everything's rolled into a marketing budget so yeah. the only reason i'm making these videos is promote future tour dates so it'll all be about promoting a tour date hey we're coming to dot 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 so that's part of my marketing budget um sure but you got serious gear and people with real cameras and uh yeah. it's not like someone like a kid out there with a dslr like you have a real team by the way we have a few DS, DS, dlsrs too but no i think i think we have a uh red camera or black magic i forget and sure. then we I don't know. We just, yeah, we sh just shoot it professionally, but then it's not that expensive. I mean, my, I, I can break down my budget for you, but it's, it, the hardest part is flights. Mm -hmm. Um, everyone lives on the bus. Right. So we all live together. The bus is already paid for. So if I can stack up every bunk, I'm making money. Mm -hmm. Um, the activities I pay for, and I just put it in a marking budget. Same thing. Like, you know, I, I, I have X amount of dollars that I look to market my tours yeah. and I just market them differently. Normally that budget would go to, um, print ads radio buys That's um, fun. billboards no but right. yeah for me i go hold on let's get a private jet yeah and let's shoot a video at the private jet let's make this a marketing expense mm -hmm. and let's do something fun let's do something crazy like i'll go or, like in orlando in Tam florida we're flying into i think we're flying into the bahamas for three days to go spear fishing because that'll just help promote Tour, people will watch that video mm -hmm. and maybe they'll go shit he's coming to my town and it'll promote tour dates isn't it the best that you could just write off all of that yeah i don't know i mean i don't know if i can write it all off but yeah oh well, I, I mean i write off i write off as no much way. as i can all i know okay i go out to eat for dinner and i take a picture of my food and that is a business expense that's fucking brilliant well yeah. that's that's right up your alley uh, there's no people will be like hold on you can write off a portion of your, your food bird yeah that's, <laughs> i don't know if you can write all of it off <laughs> right <laughs> the irs is gonna be like we've never seen someone eat this much yeah and try to write it off no but i i look at everything we do on the road as um as a marketing expense because it's just promoting the tour and everything that promotes the tour sells tickets and right. then that generates its own income look if you know not to not to whittle down budgets too much but if this adds one show for me mm -hmm. uh then it paid for itself okay so and and i'll give you another so I don't know if you ever saw the video I did dancing to like the Post Malone song. Oh, I showed my wife that. Yeah. I love that one. So that was the first time I did anything like that. Okay. So I took, I did, I took um, 
dancing classes for twelve hundred dollars mm -hmm. from a young lady, and then shot. I think it was less than ultimately my whole budget was twelve hundred dollars, mm -hmm. which actually I thought was a lot of money at the time. And I put I was getting ready to do a, a theater tour, and I put that video out, and it sold out very quickly. Cleaned up every show that was that had ticket sales, and it added second shows to every single one of those, and then sold that out. So wow. our price point for uh, money invested versus money on ret return of in pro return of investment was fucking astronomical yeah and then my buddy tom segura did a video uh in reply he did a dancing video saying he was a better dancer stabbed me at the end which i still don't find hilarious <laughs> stabbed me at the end <laughs> scrolled his tour dates sold out every one of his australia dates and added shows there and then i was like fuck this and then wow. i did the marching band one mm -hmm. hired a marching band for like two thousand dollars had him come to my house i didn't even have a game plan i yeah. was like just come to my house and we'll figure something out they looked around. They're like, I go, do you guys know a song? They're like, Rubber Band Man. I was like, that's our song. Okay. And I go, get around my pool. And I, we just wrote it in the moment. It literally took us 15 minutes to shoot is me go, all right, I'll, uh, I'm going to walk out and I'm going to go, guys, I got a big announcement. And then I want the drummer to walk out behind me and start playing the drums. I'm going to announce my tour dates. We're going to reveal the band and we're going to dance and scroll tour dates. And mm -hmm. we did that, sold out every show, added shows. And I was wow. like, great. So then, I mean, and so that's always been my MO of like, and now I'm just investing more money in it thinking, first of all, I have a film crew with me. If I want to do a fun promo video, I always have that opportunity, mm -hmm. but like, uh, or like the, the best ones are like the one I did today. I think it went up on Instagram. The one I did today was just me. It was just me. The second you pull a camera up, something's going to come up. Like the second you show, you pull up a camera, you're going to come up with an idea. That's the way my brain works. Mm -hmm. So I found out I could memorize. I didn't know that my whole life. I could never memorize because I was always memorizing on a blank canvas. But when we did the movie, I found out I memorized very quickly if you blocked out a scene. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, if I had it blocked out, I was like, oh, I, I know exactly what to say. And I learned lines quicker than anyone else on set. Hmm. And Mark Hamill was like, you have an amazing ability of learning a lot like that's not everyone's like you and i went hmm. wait I, i'm bad at memorization and so then i was in my thing and i was like i wonder if i could do that with tour dates mm. and i was like i always know my tour dates i could always tell you my tour dates and so i s s pulled up my camera and i just tried to recite tour dates off the top of my head and i fucking rattled them all off and i was like whoa so i just i figured the second you pull up a camera something shows up cool yeah that's awesome well and that's what you're looking for that's probably what you were looking for from the publicist who said um have you thought about going on rogan again is like this is like kind of outside the box content marketing that's going to get people really interested they're going to share it it's it's viral it's shareable it's like that's it just has to come from you it's, it's yeah. really hard to hire somebody to be a creative force behind something like that someone who's very creative yeah and i think that's i think that is why you're succeeding so much right now because you're just driving your own ship. You know what direction you want to go. If a storm's coming, you decide whether to go through it or go around it. Yeah. You know, I yeah. think that's, and that's why I was drawn to you. And I, I think it's so cool that I got to sit down and hang out with you. It's, I think we've been doing over two hours. So I'm going to, we'll, I'll wrap this up. Sure. But, um, but what, so are you heading back to Vietnam when things cool down? So we had to leave Vietnam because uh, COVID got really bad there. Yeah. And so everybody was just kind of locked down in their houses for a long time. My whole team was just locked down in their apartments, their houses. And uh, so COVID's horrible in Vietnam right now. Yeah. And so l luckily, most the two big cities, Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City, are mostly vaccinated. And that's going to help. And they're starting to open up again now. Um, but that was already two, three months ago when I left. My, my wife and I both left. We came here and we've been shooting here. We shot in Minnesota. We just got done shooting in Texas. And I think we're heading to Mexico next. I want to. Uh, I don't want to stay in the U.S. I love Vietnam. I'll I'll come back here eventually. Yeah. After like my first heart attack or something, <laughs> and I need the and I need like a good hospital. But yeah. Vietnam is great. <laughs> I love it. My team is there, and but I can't go back now, even if I, if I want to, because foreigners aren't allowed in. Okay. And so even though I'm I'm married, I, I really I don't think I can get into Vietnam, and it's going to take some time. So they're just slowly opening the city again. It could be another six months, nine months, really, maybe twelve months before I could even go back. So we got to kind of bop around the world until until that time. Wow. So I, I don't know. 
But we don't have any home base right now. I mean, the base is technically my office is still in Vietnam, but just one person is there right now. Sweet. So what's what are your plans? Do you do you know where you'll be for the next six months? Are you really just going to float around? Yeah, floating around. We don't know. So, I mean, even we're trying to plan out the next few weeks. We know that in three weeks we're going to be shooting in Mexico uh, and we're going to bop around the USA a little bit. We'll probably stay here for a week or so. Well, check my tour dates out. Come shoot something with me. All right. I'm on the road. Um. Cool. I hope you like barbecue because that's only the only towns we hit. I love barbecue. I, I was just in Texas. Barbecue. I love yeah. Texas. Um, so we're we know for sure we're going we're going to go to Mexico, and then after that, unknown. We maybe South America would be good because you know South America is really hard to get to from Vietnam. It takes like two days. Oh yeah. So it's like let's do the Americas while we're here. Oh yeah, do all the shit you can't get to from there. Right. Well, so uh, but but it's unknown. Really, month to month, we don't have like a six month plan right now. I mean, I even had to replace my shooters. My shooters are Vietnamese. The embassy was closed down for months. They couldn't even apply to get a visa to come to the USA. Oh my God. I had to leave them behind. I had to get a new team here. They're they're up and running. They're doing pretty good, but it takes a lot of time to train people in for a completely new and different style of shooting. Um, uh, so what we'll see we'll see what happens. I don't know. God damn. The future is unknown. Yeah, this freaking pandemic. I was really lucky. The first year in Vietnam, there was almost no community spread. And so for the first year, we were going everywhere in the country with no mask on. And so we shot like 100 Vietnam videos. And I was like, this is going to take. Oh, so you, do you have stuff backlogged where you can release content? No, we've already. Uh, no, we only have like 10 backlogged at this moment. Oh, wow. Um, but we, we, what is, is this on? Look at me going on a big podcast. <laughs> I don't have this on. Do not disturb. Um, We. So we were really fortunate because I thought my channel was going to tank because uh, we couldn't travel anywhere. Well, it turns out Vietnam is traveling. Yeah. Just living there counts as traveling. Meanwhile, everyone in L.A. was social distancing and wearing masks. And and did they really do late night TV in people's houses or was that just for YouTube? No. Nope, is that real? Nope. Yeah, yeah, they did. Like, I think Jimmy Kimmel did it out of his house. Okay, so the bar for entertainment got really low. Understandably so. <laughs> but... <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. I don't know how to not. There was a point where I was like, Trevor Noah's doing what we're doing. <laughs> I know. I was like, right? We do the same thing. I know. Why did that count as TV? Anyway, so. Um, why did that I, count as TV? <laughs> and then, by the way, why are they going back into studios? Just And by the way, why couldn't people have more expensive cameras than just a Zoom? You'd see some people on a Zoom, you'd be like, yo, step up your fucking game. I know. Send them a camera or something. Send a fucking CNN guy in a hazmat suit to put a fucking camera in. <laughs> So we were lucky that we could just shoot. A, we shot a hundred videos in Vietnam. We're looking for every episode we could think of. We're like, all right, a whole video. We eat testicles from four different types of animals. Yeah. Because uh, there's all these videos online that are cute. Eating Disney food for 24 hours. I'm like, we're, we're doing testicles for 24 hours. <laughs> then brains, then livers. And so we did fa food factories. We did tribes. We did as much stuff as we could think of oh, there. that's great. And, and then it worked out really well for about a year. And then that's when stuff started to get bad. I mean, as we know now, you can't keep the virus out forever. Australia, yeah. New Zealand, like Taiwan, all these places that did really well for a long time. It's seeping in. It's finding ways to get in. We, we You can't fight it forever. So hopefully, yeah, I mean, uh, pray for Vietnam. I hope they get back on their feet soon. Yeah. And then uh, we'll, we'll head back there as soon as we can. But for now, I'm, I'm trying to enjoy... Being able to travel with my wife for the first time, she's she has a, a, a full time job at a bank, like a normal job job the whole time we've been together. So she's got like two weeks off a year. Oh, that's nice. So I'm like, I'm going to Namibia. See you in a couple of weeks. And then she she just didn't travel with me at all. We travel a couple of times a year to to go somewhere. But now she's like full on joining me everywhere we go. So it's been nice to go around with her and and uh, get to experience all this stuff with her by my side. That's fucking great. So wait, what do you, what do you think of? Use Halston's mic. But what do you think of America? Oh, you're on the podcast now. Yeah. What do you think of America? So she was here a couple of years ago, oh right before the I pandemic. I love America so much. Like, yeah. you know, like people here is super nice and open. And like, I got compliments on the streets with the random people all the time. Like, oh my gosh, you look so cute. I love your outfits. Yeah. But you know, like in Vietnam, like I think like it's Asian culture. We don't, we don't do that. We don't never like, oh, you cute. No. <laughs> we don't do that. And then like, I love it. And I think like, before I went to America, I a little bit, I have a little bit of fear because I heard about like Asian haze or something oh, yeah. like that. But when I got here and every, everybody loved me. 
yeah. like fr- so friendly. So I enjoy so much, and <laughs> I, I, I think like being with my husband is help too. Right, yeah. I'm with him, and he big. You see that <laughs> he's a big guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So like nobody can like mess around with me, and then, so I enjoy it so much. I think I, I think the Asian hate's been absolutely horrible that you see in this country. Uh, it it has been, but because I you know having friends. I mean, I live in LA, so there's I have, we have a lot of Asian friends, but hmm. it's just kind of exhausting that 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 people feel that way. Uh, but I think also the media kind of definitely tried to highlight it, and 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 there was a there was a, a a dialogue of its white supremacists, white nationalists. I don't know, I, and so I, I think you're gonna get nothing but love, in, and well, definitely in this area. Yeah, yeah, it's another well, one of those things. It's not like I'm not uh, not to say it doesn't not exist, to, but not downplaying, but it, it gets but yeah. broadcast. And signal boosted so much that it's like, oh, sh- um, you know, somebody else on my team is like, should we have a talk about this? I'm like, no, it's fine. It's, yeah. it's going to be fine. And it's been nothing- from two white guys. Trust me, you got nothing to worry about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Listen, we're not attacking you. <laughs> <laughs> that's fucking great. That's uh, that's awesome. I'm glad you. It's uh, yeah. It's uh, I'm trying to think where you should go to eat while you're in an LA. How long are you in LA for? Uh, about a week. Um, I can't wait to get Asian food. So I've had Vietnamese food in the Midwest, in yeah. Colorado, <laughs> and Texas was pretty good. But Our fuzz legit here. Yeah. Fucking legit. In the Midwest, there's, uh, I don't know what's going on there. Uh, you, uh, let me tell you something. It's brutal. I had I had pho in Macon, Georgia, that was, I said, what color were the people that made this? Because this isn't pho. <laughs> right. Just so we're clear, this is not pho. Right. And, uh. <laughs> And but here, like, here you got the good stuff. Oh, here you got legit. You gotta, you gotta go to Kogi. You gotta go to Kogi. That's Roy Choi's place. The guy that has a show with John, his Kogi Taco Truck, K O G I. Okay, and uh, that is that is so. To for a foodie, you'll really respect what he's done. He has done. I think he has kimchi tacos, which are phenomenal. Mm-hmm. But he has take he has really fusioned kind of Korean and Mexican food. And done and done this like Korean barbecue Mexican food taco truck, and it is fun. I mean, it's fu- fucking nominal. Mm-hmm. K- Kogi. There's a there's another one that's like Koji. I think the oh. Kogi okay. is Roy Choi's truck. You got to try that out. Absolutely, yeah. will do. Um, trying to think of anything else, and then and then authentic Mexican food, like the, yeah, with like like authentic where the tacos are like this big and you're getting tongue taco mm. those are the fucking those are like i wish i knew more about food I'm, I, I'm just i eat it so fast i barely get to know its name <laughs> right. you know i'm like fuck. yeah i'm with you i'm it's funny because <laughs> uh just uh, the last thing well <laughs> you can end the show whatever you want it's your show but uh <laughs> we were we were uh eating one day yeah. uh, on the bed it's a saturday i think uh sometimes you know during the pandemic it's fun to start drinking at 10 a.m and um <laughs> Just sitting on the bed, watching the TV, vegging out. I have Jack Daniels in one hand and uh, Pizza Hut stuffed crust pizza in the other hand. Mind you, I'm in Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some of the best food in the world. Yeah. I'm eating that, and then my wife goes, "Do you know what my coworkers say? They say they say I'm so lucky to be with a guy who does food reviews." And I'm just sitting there with like sauce on my belly. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, yeah, this is, they think I have some of the best food experiences you can have in the world. I'm like, and there you are just destroying your stomach. But there's cheese in the crust. Yeah. There's <laughs> cheese. Come Look, on. Dude, I got, there was a fucking show on History Channel about the history of pizzas. And all of a sudden mm. I'm like, oh, I got to get Pizza Hut, man. I didn't know there was a different crust. I was <laughs> right? like, shut the fuck up. That's why I liked it. And then I was like, oh God, I got to go Domino's, man. Mm-hmm. The, the fucking food, History Channel's doing food pretty fucking awesome right now. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So I think that's where Adam Richmond's new show is man modern marvels and he does food and then he's got another one coming out but yeah i fucking dude thank you for doing this thank hey, you very much for doing this this it was such a pleasant surprise no one listened to the end of the podcast right so it's just me and you know by the way that's when you can say the worst things ever i, know, I don't right? think anyone's listening <laughs> uh it was a huge pleasant surprise to to hear you talk about my show in general oh, and of and, course uh, huge fan and then to be invited here um uh, it's been great it's been well, great getting to know you everyone go check it out subscribe on youtube boost up his views bring in that ad sales dollar and fucking keep this show afloat while this pandemic cools out in vietnam so yeah, we no get doubt. more more asian food because asian food fucking kills it man mm. yeah thank you thank you